And welcome into the broadcast booth alongside Keith Hernandez and Ron Darling. I'm Gary Cohen. Very excited to bring you our fifth season of Mets baseball on SNY. And, you know, opening day is a special day on any field, but uh, when that flag covers the outfield and both teams are lined up on the foul lines and uh, you've got four troops singing the national anthem, there's, there's just something very special about this day, no matter what year it is. Well, opening day is always a great day for the players, for the fans. I think it's pretty important to note that this is the 65th anniversary of the Battle of Okinawa in World War II, and it's ironic that uh, former Met manager Gil Hodges fought in that battle, and how ironic and how nice that we have the, the troops here with the flag and really thinking of Gill opening this season. Well, it's a goosebump moment. I mean, when I lo- watch that flag unfurl, to me, honestly, because I wish I wasn't so old and decrepit, that I'd like to get out there and compete. Uh, but it's fun to watch uh, opening day, of course. Now, the Mets have gone through a, a very tumultuous offseason following a very difficult 2009, and there are a lot of question marks surrounding this team. They've got Jose Reyes and Carlos Beltran and Daniel Murphy on the disabled list as we begin the season. But at the same time, you look up and down the Mets' offense, and there are some reasons for optimism. Well, this team's going to hit. And when they get Beltron and Reyes back, they will hit. I think the main thing is Bay was the big acquisition, and you always worry about the spotlight. Well, Jason Bay took over for Manny Ramirez in Boston, a tough place to play. And what did he do in 200 games? He had 45 home runs and drove in 156 runs. So that's not a problem. I love the way Wright swung the bat this spring. He looked terrific. They're going to have to need the, 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 those two bats. They're going to need it from them until they get Beltran and Reyes back. And so Bay and Wright will try and uh, carry the offense through the early season until they get the uh, the big guns back to join them. As far as the pitching is concerned, that's where the season might hold its key because you've got Johan Santana at the front. He'll pitch today, but what comes next is the issue. It really is the issue. When you think about it, it's really the next three guys with Pelfrey, Main, and Perez behind Santana are really going to have to make the big difference. They're going to have to have 90 starts between those three guys. We know what Santana's going to do. It's great to have him pitching here on opening day. And the Marlins are the opposition. They have been a huge thorn in the side of the Mets over the last few seasons. They won 87 games last year, and they bring to the table one of the best players and one of the best pitchers in the National League. And, of course, we're talking about, first of all, Hanley Ramirez. Well, when I saw Hanley Ramirez in spring training, I said, welcome to the club. He's a batting champion last year of the National League. He hit over 340, just a terrific player. He improved on his defense, too, and his overall attitude. He's really grown as a player, and he is one of the top five players in Major League Baseball. And the Mets were able to beat Josh Johnson in spring training this year, they'll try and do it for the first time in the regular season. Yeah, he's undefeated against the Mets uh, in his career. 15-5 and five last season, and one of the bright young pitchers.
Ah. is that both Matthews and Pagan will play over the six weeks, at least until Carlos Beltran is ready to come back. But the Mets are hoping to get off to a fast start. Opening days belong to the Mets over the last four decades. They've won 31 of their last 40 opening day games, a phenomenal winning percentage of over 750, and we'll see if they can keep that going today. And how many years did it take them, Gary, to win their first opening well, they day? lost their first eight. They won a World <laughs> Series before they won an opening day game. That always helps when you have guys like Santana, Seaver, and Gooden who start those first, first that, games. That helps. <laughs> Third straight opening day start for Santana as a Met. Chris Coughlin will lead off, and the 49th season of New York Mets baseball is set to get underway. And Santana starts off with a strike. Beautiful fastball. Johan 13-9 last year, an injury-shortened season, had arthroscopic surgery on the 1st of September to remove bone chips. Second time in his career he's had to undergo that kind of surgery. This is the only left-hander in the modern lineup today, the rookie of the year last year, Chris Co Coughlin. Coglin didn't come up till early May last year. Started hitting and never stopped. Wound up hitting 321 for the year. And edged out a pretty strong field for National League rookie honors. And the slider misses 2-1. and one. Mets would love Santana to get off to the same start he did last season. His first seven starts, his ERA was 0 0.78. I can't remember a more beautiful day yeah. for opening day. I mean, it's always freezing. And the fastball sits high, and he falls behind Coglin, three and one. And that's the old Met uniform right there, and uh, Gary, the old 60 Mets with the pinstripes. Well, they went with the uh, the the sort of off white with the pinstripes, more reminiscent of, of the 1960s. And Coglin pops it up, playable for right with the glasses down, and David puts it away for the first down of the season. Sun is certainly going to be an issue today. Not much wind, though. Yeah, but but this is more like playing in spring training, well, isn't it? It's interesting. The flag on the right field line was blowing in from a while ago. Now it's blowing out. It's a, it's a little bit tricky here what's going on with the wind today. Wind out of the south today. So it is certainly not a typical April day by any means, and it's only supposed to get warmer the next two or three days. Beautiful. I love it. It's one of the changes in the field, Keith. They only have it blowing out when the Mets are at bat. <laughs> it took a lot of uh, extra work this winter. Well, here is Cameron Mabin, who uh, is trying again to secure the everyday center field job for the Marlins. He had it last year at the beginning of the season, didn't hit and got sent down. And he was a part of that big trade with the Tigers, and uh, he was one of the big guys. Lots of talent. Hasn't hit yet. Just turned 23 yesterday, and the good changeup by Santana, one and one. His problem has always been is that 
he strikes out about a third of his at-bats. He's got a bit of a long swing, but most people are going to miss this excellent change up here from Santana. Yeah, they worked on this spring uh, shortening his stroke up. And yeah, Maven can't catch the fastball. So Santana showed him the change up and then threw one by him. With the change of speeds, trying to hit against Johan Santana is like trying to hit on top of a seesaw. You're going back and forth with speeds. One-two to Maven. He struck him out. First strikeout of the season for Santana. Two out and nobody on. Well, just alternating fastball changeup and the put-away pitch, of course. It's the ability to throw that ball out of the strike zone. Look at the grip of that changeup. Coming off all of those four fingers and turning over with that left hand to make the ball go down in the strike zone. So Santana gets exactly where he wants to be against Hanley Ramirez, facing him with two out and nobody on. Last year's National League batting champion. Still just 26 years old, a lifetime 316 hitter. Notice the Ronnie uh, Gary, the sink on Santana's changeup. And that last pitch on the strikeout to Maven threw it knee high, and it sunk out of the strike zone. That is called, that is a perfect bait pitch. And Santana last year with those bone chips in his elbow, unable to get his arm fully up, unable to get full extension, and that changeup was not as sharp. Really the big difference with any pitcher. Finishing your pitches will give you late life. And that's what Santana lacked at the end of last year. Behind 2-0, and oh, and he comes with a fastball, and Ramirez lifts one out to right for Frank Kaur. And so Johan Santana starts the afternoon with a 1-2-3 inning. The Mets come to bat when we come back. Here's your Geico Mets starting lineup for opening day. Alex Cora rather than Jose Reyes at short. Gary Matthews Jr. rather than Carlos Beltran at center field. And Mike Jacobs rather than Daniel Murphy at first base. But you've got Wright and Bay and Frank Cora to provide power from the right side. And Josh Johnson on the mound for Florida, dealing to Alex Cora. And he takes the first pitch for ball one. You want to say that Josh Johnson kills the Mets at 7-0, but he really kills the National League East, where he's 20-4. and four, One of the bright young pitchers in baseball, all six foot seven inches of them. And it's only gotten better since Tommy John surgery, as Cora fouls one away. Since coming back from Tommy John surgery in the middle of 2008, Josh Johnson is 22-6. and six. You know, I was talking to him about 
what was the thing of Tommy John surgery that made him come out uh, and be such a dominant pitcher. He said it was the first time that he really channeled all his workouts and worked out every single day. Oh, good fastball. You know, Ron, talking about uh, Johnson and his 20 and 4. He's the third pitcher to win 21 of his first 25. Dave McNally back in the old Orioles. Wow. And Barry Zito. You mean against his own division? Right. A pitch hit Cora, who will get plunked by an occasional pitch. And so the Mets have a leadoff base run. Well, this is a slider right here, I believe. And I don't think there was much effort to get out of the way of that ball. Well, that has become the norm now. These guys will not get out of the way. Good job by Alex to stand in there. And what does they say? Taking one for the team. Yep. So Cora's aboard, and now here's Luis Castillo. Castillo had a good offensive season as the number two hitter last year, a 387 on base percentage, and he will often bunt in the first inning in situations like these, and maybe even more so with Santana against Johnson, figuring it could be a very low scoring game. But up there, set to swing, and takes ball one. Johnson does a nice job the, uh, of fielding his position. You see the defense there, Keith. And at the corners, of course. You've got to play. Let's see if Jerry starts out quick and aggressively with a hit and run here. I always felt that Castillo is a good hit and run guy. Hits the ball the other way. It was not utilized enough to hit and run. Make it happen. Cora stole eight bases last year. Well, I'm with you, Keith, as David Wright's on deck. Uh, the same old, same old hasn't worked against Johnson. Let's change it up a little bit. And you haven't got a base dealing threat in Cora out there. You know, as opposed to get a Jose Reyes. Well, Cantu certainly playing it close at third as Gabby Sanchez holds Cora, who shortens up his lead. And a slow ground ball. Ugler to Ramirez. And they oh. do not turn to. Close play at first base. But Castillo beats it out. Ugler here just, I didn't think charged quick enough. I'm being a little overly critical, but great hustle by Castillo here. Also, Keith, Gabby Sanchez at one point could stretch a little more here at first base. That's a play, Ronnie, where you can cheat. A terrible stretch. Very good, Ron. I should know that. How do you know that? You're a pitcher. <laughs> no, I always wanted a double play. That's why. <laughs> and a good call by Laz Diaz as Castillo certainly appeared to beat it. So the Mets with one out and one on, and now David Wright, who looked like a changed hitter during spring training this year. We'll see whether he can carry it over to the regular season. One of his last spring training efforts was a double and a home run against Josh Johnson. Well, remember, the last spring start that Johnson had was against the Mets at Port St. Lucie with that wind blowing out the right field. They gave up two home runs to Bay. And I believe right, I'm yes. not sure. And they were both to right field. And just thinking that maybe Johnson might be pounding inside early since the Mets were setting up away on him in the last spring start. Polino sets up away for this pitch. It was last Thursday. Johnson was coming back from the flu. He hadn't pitched in 10 days. That might have been a factor, but Wright certainly put a charge in the way. Yes, he did. And so did Bay. Identical pitches, fastballs away. So see if... Uh, Johnson put that in the back of his head and fired it. David hit five home runs during spring training. That's as many as he hit at City Field all last year. He drives this one to right field over toward the corner. That ball is out of here. David Wright hits a two-run homer in his first and bat of the season. And the Mets jump out to a two-nothing lead. Set up away, and that ball's up. It was a little cutter. Fastball, Ronnie, look at fastball. Yeah, just fastball got, on the outside part. Got it up, and he may have to change the program. And what a great start for David Wright. So critical. Mike Jacobs in his return to the Mets takes a strike. Well, that's a part of the ballpark the Mets didn't utilize last year. You know, David's power is generally the straightaway right and right center, but he hit that one down the line, which is where you can uh, you know, pick up a less than solidly struck home run. Well, Keith, I thought you made the great point, and the point is, is that someone went to school and someone did not. David Wright, remembering that Johnson pitched him away, stayed with the same game plan, and 
Josh Johnson did not. By a TV pitch differential, you see they wanted that ball down, but it was way up, up compared and, to where he wanted and it. And too much play. So Johnson, who gave up just 14 home runs in 209 innings last year, yields one in his first inning this season. Jacobs, the former Marlin, takes low and hit two and two. Mike was a 38th round draft pick by the Mets back in 1999. Made his big league debut with the Mets in 2005. Jason Bay, who also had a previous tour through the Mets farm system, waiting for his first Met at bat on deck. Two two to Jacobs, and he waves oh. the fastball away. And Johnson has his first strikeout, two down. And now the Met debut of Jason Ben. You see his numbers last year in Boston, where he replaced a legend in Manny Ramirez. He swings the bat. Let me tell you, he reminds me of when Ray Knight, when the Reds traded Pete Rose, and Ray Knight had to come up from AAA, a young man, not the age of Jason Bay, a rookie, and take Pete Rose's place, and he had a great year, hit 300, I believe, his first year. It's similar to what Bay had to go through in Boston replacing Romero. So there's no question that Bay can play in the spotlight. You surprised the way the uh, Marlins are playing him in the outfield as you look at some uh, some notes on Bay who was in the Mets farm system briefly after Montreal and before San Diego. Pitch him away, play him away, huh? And that just showed him a fastball in the pitch prior to keep him honest. Well, look at maybe look how far over in right center I mean, look, he is. Look at this. Yeah. I mean, here's center field right there. That's that's really shading him the other way. And this is a guy who's noted as a, a pull hitter, but pitching him away. And he fouls it away. And remember that Bay hit a home run against Johnson in Florida in yep. straightaway center field. That's it, just 95 home runs last year, last in the majors. They've already got one on the board. And a base hit for Jason Bay in his first net at bat. Well, there's no doubt that this club is going to hit and score runs. And that's another ball up, Ronnie. Josh, same pitch. Josh Johnson, when he's at his best, you very rarely see a ball above the knees. See plenty of them here in the first inning. Think he's a little pumped up? Yeah, throw, a little overthrowing for the young man. Yep. Look at his swing. Good balance. Good top hand. He's a real top hand hockey swinger right there. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> British Columbian. Here's Gary Matthews, Jr., Home Depot defense for the Marlins. You saw that. It errors at the bottom there. This is not a great defensive ball club, although I do think they kind of improved with Sanchez at first and Coughlin in left field. It may have been in center. It's still not a strong defensive ball club. See Ronnie Polino behind the plate. He platoons with John Baker. Getting the start with the lefty on the mound for the Mets. Gary Matthews, a switch hitter. Ooh. And he gets it on his hands. Polino coming back. Not much room back there, but enough for Polino to make the grab to end the inning. But the Mets get off to a fast start against a nemesis, Josh Johnson. David Wright looking for a bigger power year. Well, the signs are very strong early as David goes up on And the Mets take a 2 nothing lead into the second.
opening day. And Johan Santana staked to a 2-0 lead on the strength of David Wright's second career opening day home run. Jorge Cantu has always been a huge thorn on the Mets side. Leads off for the Marlins. 100 RBIs last year despite hitting only 16 home runs. You can relate to that, Keith. Um, absolutely. I absolutely can. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll say absolutely again. <laughs> Why don't you bring that up? <laughs> You know, that you don't have to hit a ton of home runs to drive in runs. Absolutely. Well, and that is, you hit in the clutch, you hit in the clutch. I always used to look at the guys that drove in 90 runs and hit 25, 30 home runs. Like, they weren't very clutch. And what would I have done if I had hit 30 home runs? Well, I didn't. Can't do foul. Tips one, one and two. I think that's the Marlins, though. When you look at their team, they have guys that... You know, kind of no names in baseball, like Cantu, like Ross in right field. And you look at their numbers at the end of last year, very substantial numbers. Freddy Gonzalez now in his fourth year as Marlon Skipper. They won 87 games last year. Their payroll this year is up from 36 million to 46 million. And for the first time in the last three years, they do not have the lowest payroll in baseball. They're spending more right now than San Diego or Pittsburgh, but there's a little pressure coming from ownership. Yes. There always has been. Popped up. And let's see if Barajas has room. One away. New York Mets baseball on SNY is brought to you by State Farm. Today's State Farm agent of the day is Pat Cawley of Glendale, New York. By AT&T. By Geico. By American Airlines. We know why you fly. We're American Airlines. And by McFadden's coming to City Field this season. One of the consequences of the Marlins spending a few more dollars this offseason is the fact that they were able to retain Dan Ugla, who everybody thought was going to be traded away before his uh, contract numbers got too big. They retained Dan Ugla, and also they signed Josh Johnson to a four-year contract. So they're starting to tie up some of the young talent yep. uh, past their free agent years. Last year, they tied up Hanley Ramirez. So that's the core of their team. Ugla didn't have a, had a down year last year. There were 31 home runs, but only 91 ribeye stakes. Well, he accomplished something no second baseman ever has before, a third consecutive 30 home run season. First time in the history of the game that a second baseman has done that as the changeup misses. But talking about ownership, I mean, Jeffrey Loria, the owner, and, and Larry Beinfest, the general manager, have made it clear they expect this team to win the World Series. And I don't know if that's an unrealistic expectation after 87 wins, but it certainly puts a lot of pressure on this team. David Wright gets in front of the ground ball, and the sidearm throw gets ugly for the second out. They've been dropping down a little with that throw. There's some of the offseason changes for the Marlins. Their longtime right fielder, Jeremy Hermita, has moved on. And that Nate Robertson, the left-handed pitcher they got late in spring training, the Detroit Tigers. They have four right-handed starters. Robertson is going to fit beautifully in there in that rotation. And Nate Robinson came up for his last start, is on his first start for the Marlins in spring, and just threw six brilliant innings. And he's going to face the Mets here Thursday night. They've moved him up to the three spot in the rotation. There's Ronnie Polino, the Ooh. catcher, and he foul tips one nothing and one. You know, one thing we're not factoring in also is not only do they expect them to win, two seasons from now they're going to be in a new ballpark. So they're trying to you know, establish themselves as one of the mainstays in the National League East. One and one to Polino. That means the Mets have got to move out of that beautiful hotel. You, you, you and I are going to be down in South Beach. No, you won't. I think Charlie has South Beach in mind. I don't know if Fred Wolfon will like that or Omar. <laughs> which end of South Beach. Good changeup, although he got it up. He got Polino to swing through it, one and two. Santana's retired the first five. In the air to left center, over toward the gap. Racing over is Matthews, and he'll get there to make the grab. And in the inning, six up and six down for Johan Santana. The Mets lead 2-0.
a sterling day in the Big Apple. Perfect day for taking off from school or from work and heading out to the ballpark in Queens. We used to say the big ballpark in Queens when we played at Shea, but this is a little more uh, cozy. As players, Keith and I used to call it the big Shea, right? That's what we used to call it. That's what Murph used to say. Yeah. No, it started, you know, started saying that. That was Merle Harmon, who was the voice of the Jets in the 1960s. Oh, well, I started calling it the big Shea. <laughs> I remember one day I got late to the ballpark and was driving by LaGuardia. Shocking, by the way. Jeff Francoeur takes a mighty hack. One on one. I want to be retired because it would have been yeah. the first pregame show. And, he's, and I was driving in and I heard Mark say, oh, what a marvelous day. Big shape. <laughs> he sees statistically how much better Frank Corr was as a Met last year than he was as a Brave. And Johnson's having trouble locating his breaking stuff. That went well out of the strike zone. Frank Corr's had success against... Johnson, 318, live from good fastball in. And that's surprising with the slider that he has and the way Frank Corr fishes for bad pitches. You'd think he would really eat up a guy like Frank Corr. And Jeff lays off that one. It's three and two. We saw a little of this late in spring training. Frank Corr trying to exercise a little more patience against that breaking ball. But when you got two strikes on you, you got to go the other way. You just you got to fight. Rounds one down to third for Cantu to handle. And that's the first out of the inning. So Frank Corr retired. What a splendid afternoon. I we don't need a jacket. I got my my sports jacket off. There's the umpires gear. Wally Bell, crew chief. I see four veteran umpires retired right before opening day. I saw Eddie Montague, one of the good guys in the game, retired. Charlie Relliford was in that crew as well. So uh, the umpiring, which was very questionable around baseball last year, is getting a little bit younger. And a couple guys got let go. There's Ron Barajas in his first met at bat. Barajas will be the Mets' number one catcher this year, 34 years old, with Toronto last year. And as you see there, he's got power, not a whole lot of batting average or on-base percentage. I think what you just saw on that first pitch, or that, or that big swing by Barajas, is what you're going to get. Only walked 20 times last season. Well, you so. know who that profile is like. That's like Miguel Olivo, who used to be with uh, the Marlins, and yep. is now in Colorado. Check swing, and he went around on the breaking ball, one and two. Henry Blanco will be the backup catcher. So the Mets have a very veteran catching core with Barajas at 34 and Blanco at 38. But if they need help, they've got Josh Tolley and Omir Santos down in AAA. Ripped down the left field line, but it hooks foul. How did he stay in the box there? There's a piece of paper, a wrapper, that, <laughs> that just blew right in front of him. And to me, that's a distraction. He's getting rid of it now. But when that pitch was thrown, it was uh, right in front of home plate on the grass. And that's an automatic timeout. Let me get that paper and put it in my back pocket. And it didn't bother Bobby Thompson. You ever see the film with him oh. the home run off Ralph Branca? There are about 100 of those pieces of paper on the infield. That's when, you know, men were men. <laughs> yes, that's when pitchers, pitchers win 15 if they had to. <laughs> well, he would. He would. We certainly saw it two years ago in the last game of the season, what he will do if called upon. Second to last game, I should say. Oh. Oh, pops one up. And in shallow center, Maven is there. To put it away for the second out. Well, he got away with a hanger right there. So Barajas is retired. Now Santana. He can swing the bat. You got to be careful here. This is no uh, easy out. You know, both pitchers on both sides, Johnson, a very accomplished hitter, too, can swing the bat. There's Tom Seaver's best friend, <laughs> Mr. Mess. Now, have you been in the uh, the new Hall of Fame and Museum? No, I have not. They have the original Mr. Met outfit there. It's it's a little scary. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. Well, you remember that, don't you? Uh, only were, vaguely. Were you knee high to a grasshopper then? Very, very young. Santana grounds one down to first. Gabby Sanchez handles it. And so Johnson bounces back with a 1-2-3 inning. And if you come to City Field this year, you have got to stop by the new Mets Hall of Fame and Museum. It is just fantastic.
opening day. The Mets with a 2-0 lead on the strength of a David Wright first inning two-run homer. Johan Santana has retired the first six Marlins to face him. Cody Ross will lead off the third. Ross was very much a question mark for opening day. He suffered a variety of injuries this spring, most recently to his calf. And when we saw the Marlins less than a week ago, they did not think that he was going to be ready today. And he's probably not 100%, but you know, Cody Ross is a tough little guy, and he wanted to be in there today. As given the Mets fits, and he hits one toward the hole. Nice diving stop by Corr. Tries to right himself and throws right on target. It would have been a tough play anyway. It turned even tougher when he had trouble getting up. Well, this this ball was ripped. One hopper by Cora. Very nice play. There's Mr. Cora right there. The charts got him, Keith. Cora way in the hole. Yes, he's a pull header. Ross is a guesser. Nice play. Almost stopped him coming up. 6-3 on your scorecard. And that's a typical reaction right there from the Met Ace. Seven in a row now for Santana with some help from Alex Cora. And now the rookie first baseman, Gabby Sanchez. And he takes a strike. Sanchez won the job last year, and they had big, great expectations. Did not hit well last year. Got sent down, and he's getting a second chance. 16 home runs in AAA last year in only 85 games. Kevin Burkhardt is with us. For the Hello, fourth, fourth straight year, and we've sent him all the way to the promenade level. Kevin? I couldn't get a seat, guys. So <laughs> this is the best I have for today. Yeah, it's, yeah, what a day. I mean, just beautiful for opening day. And, you know, you talk a little bit about this team and what you saw in spring training. And the chemistry for this team, this is my fourth year, the best that this team chemistry has been. Just fantastic. A lot of the newcomers feeling right at home. You know, and, and some telling things, too. You know, the Team USA against Team Canada hockey game, uh, they went out to the local sports bar, and everybody was cheering and, and had different things on the line there. Alex Cora said a pretty revealing thing to me. He said, you know, last year with the World Baseball Classic, coming to a new team, my best teammate was Dustin Pedroia. He said it was just kind of, you never really got on the same page. He said this year we've had so many opportunities to bond to get to know each other. And it kind of turned into Jeff Francoeur's clubhouse. He was a guy, you always heard him talking. The bottom line is, this team has a good feel. I asked Jerry Manuel about that, about the team chemistry. He thinks it's really terrific. He said it is, but... You find out about team chemistry when you hit adversity. When you go to adversity, if the chemistry is good enough, it pulls you through. Of course, guys, it would be nice if there was no adversity for this team to face. And the other thing is, I think just first impressions, and that is Jason Bay. And I know you guys can comment on this, but Bay, just so impressive with his professionalism, his attitude. He's got that dry, sarcastic sense of humor. You get the feeling he'll do very well here in New York. Guys? Actually, I think it's a perfect bookend for Jeff Francoeur. <laughs> And that foul tip, not held. Well, I think Kevin makes a good point. And from my experience, this is a much better clubhouse, uh, diverse clubhouse. It is just a nice blend. And uh, I agree. Frank Corr has kind of taken over that that role there. And I like the idea that they was kind of gabbing a little bit with the Red Sox. And you told him, hey, cut the cord. You're on the Mets now. I thought that was terrific. Hey, guy. Guys, we always talk about chemistry, and especially, you know, myself, because I'm, I'm in the clubhouse and I see a lot of it in action. How important is it? I mean, it seems like people have different views on it. I mean, th this team, you talk to a man, and there's no denying. They all say that this is this is a real good bond going on here. So how much does that factor in? Well, you know, Kev, uh, look at the, uh, the swimming A's back. They hated each other. Reggie Jackson got in a fight with Bill North. They didn't, uh, Gene Tennis. They didn't like each other, and they won three championships. But it does help to have chemistry, though, Ron. Listen, you like to have both, but if you have the option of chemistry and good players, I'll take good players any day. That's kind of how it goes. But, uh, Kevin, the point you're making, I think, is that you're always going to go through an adverse time during the season. You're going to lose two or three straight. And it's when you're close that you can kind of pull each other up by the bootstraps and say, hey, I'm behind you. I'm on your side. We're going to get out of this thing. And, and those kind of clubhouses are winning clubhouses. And I think we've seen that, and I think Kevin can attest to this, the kind of mutual support this spring. You know, even guys like Mike Jacobs and Frank Catalanato lockering next to each other, competing for a job. Now, it's turned out they're, they're both on the team right now, but they could not have had, you know, better times together, even though, you know, they knew that their circumstance was such that they could easily be, be enemies, but they weren't. And I think that kind of thing is, is nice to see. There's Frank right there. 
This will be the tenth pitch of the at bat to Gabby Sanchez. And the changeup popped up foul. It'll have to throw one more. A little battle here. Pitcher Josh Johnson, who had three home runs last year, is on deck. It is just such a treat to be here in your shirt sleeves in this beautiful weather. And I'm sure the fans here in New York, I was down in Florida all year, and it was cold down there. But you, I know you fans up here really suffered through a very bitter winter. And this is a beautiful spring day. Not just snow and cold, but more recently rain. Too much. Beautiful. Up the middle, and Sanchez has a base hit. So that long battle won by the rookie, and Sanchez is the first base runner of the afternoon for the Marlins. Get your 2010 Mets tickets for opening week and other games throughout the season at City Field. Tickets start at $11. Call 718-507-TIXX or visit Mets.com now for your tickets. The view from just inside the newly named Shea Bridge out in right center field. Ceremonies were held this morning honoring the Shea family. And William Shea, who had his name on the ballpark for 45 years. Josh Johnson up there to bunt with one on and one out, and he takes a strike. And there's that Shea Bridge and the plaque commemorating the naming of that bridge. Just a natural, isn't it, to have that name, bridge named after Mr. Shea, now the bridge between the old ballpark that Keith and I played in, of course, in this beauty. One and one to Johnson. It was at 10.15 this morning. Uh, 23 members of the Shea family were on hand today for the official naming of the bridge. Well, he and was the... I'm sorry, Gary. He was the mover and shaker that brought baseball back to New York, and the National League Baseball, that is. One of many things that the Mets have done since last season to enhance the meditude of the ballpark. There you go. I mean, there are banners hanging everywhere. There are some beautiful uh, signs and pictures and mementos, and then you add in the Hall of Fame and Museum right off the, uh, the rotunda, and uh, it makes for a much more... Met feeling experience in City Field this year. And, and, and all credit to Mets management because there were a lot of complaints last year and they listened. Wright throws out Johnson, sacrifice successful, 5 to 4, moving Sanchez to second with two out. They moved the old apple from Shea Stadium from a place where people really couldn't see it in the bullpen area out front to the plaza. See many. Former and current players honored. The entrances named after Tom Seaver and Casey Stengel and Bill Hodges. As it should be. They lowered the fence just a little bit in center field. They changed the bullpen so that the uh, the relievers can see the field. It's beautiful out there. I was out there before the game. Let's see some of the murals of... Aha! Uh -huh. Mets passed. And, of course, the banners on the outfield wall and the retired numbers. Runner at second with two down, Chris Coghlan, the batter. So uh, congratulations all around to the Mets uh, marketing folks and and, uh, and ownership for, for recognizing that there was an issue here and not only taking care of it, but taking care of it in a really professional and, and classy way. I mean, you go around this ballpark, and especially in that uh, new Hall of Fame and Museum, and you just you get just the right feel. You know, it's not the Mets trying to be another franchise. It's the Mets honoring being the franchise that they are. And you saw that outfield defense off Coughlin here. And look at left field Jason Bay. Look how shallow he is in left way over. And here's, this, here's straight away. Obviously, the center fielder, Matthews, shaded way over. Very shallow in right field. Coughlin fouled out to David Wright to open the ball game. 2 nothing Mets. We're in the third. Santana had one and two. Johan retired the first seven before giving up a one-out single here in the third to Sanchez in an 11-pitch marathon. It's a nice little split screen there. Did you see that little uh, uh, back and forth? Santana with the shaking of the head. In between that at bat while Coughlin's getting ready, Brajas looking him in the eye, let him know what he wanted. Popped it up. 
Jacobs shading his eyes. And he's got it to end the end. Santana survives his first hit of the afternoon. Mets lead it 2-0. New York Mets baseball on SNY is brought to you by Bob's Discount Furniture, America's number one furniture retailer of the year. Top of the batting order for the Mets as we go to the bottom of the third. Alex Cora, Luis Castillo, and David Wright up against Josh Johnson. Last year, Johnson and Santana hooked up early in the season, and they had a classic down in Miami. Johnson with a complete game effort win. Two to one over Santana in a game that took two hours and four minutes. Santana struck out 13 that day. And it was the game in which Daniel Murphy famously dropped the fly ball in left field that helped decide it. Alex Cora hit by a pitch his first time up, and he takes a strike one and one. Hey, Darrell. He's got a vest like you working today. Looks like Otis the Trump Cicero. <laughs> <laughs> you mean from the University of Mars? <laughs> no. Lines one down the line, right into the glove of Chad, the ball boy. Chad on the scene and always gets his face on TV. Chad gets more air time than anybody, but you got to make the play. That's his kind of play. Didn't have to move. Oh, well, thank God, yeah, exactly. Thank God he made that catch. He even waffled a few people behind him. Chad going with the somewhat shorter do this year. Two and two to Cora. Alex made 69 starts for the Mets last year. John Franco also in the building. Opening day brings out all the greats. Little tapper. Oh, Johnson nice. makes the nice backhand play and throws out Cora one away. Jerry Manuel beginning his second full season as Mets manager. Of course, took over during the 2008 season. And there's a lot of pressure on Jerry right now for this team to get off to a fast start. Well, I think more pressure put on because of the spotlight and the media here in New York, I think, in any other city, particularly in the Midwest, it probably would have been cut a lot more slack with the injuries to this ball club that they had last year. But boy, they've been it's been blown hard up by the, by the press and he's, uh, you know, has to get off to a good start. And I don't really necessarily believe, believe that, Gary. Luis Castillo grounded into a force play the first time on I think if anything, Gary, that uh, if anybody's uh, there's been there, he's got a lot of problems right now with the economy. I wish him good luck. Boy, boy. Anyway, I think, Gary, that if anybody is on the hot seat, I think it's Omar. If, if anybody's going to be on the hot, more so than Jared. 
Well, the thing that might obviate against that is that Omar has a little more secure contract status than Jerry does. One and two to Castillo. But, you know, the other piece of that is if you have the highest payroll in the National League, and if the Mets don't have the highest, they're right around the highest, you should expect to compete every year. Last year, the Mets, for whatever reasons, injuries, you want to add and everything else, didn't compete. Well, you said it, Gary, in spring, all spring, and uh, Ronnie, uh, that this, uh, I thought that they were going to make moves for pitching, and Omar said, I like my young pitchers. Uh, he's rolling the dice with the with the back of the four, two, two, to, two through five uh, pitching rotation and the starters. But he did improve the hitting, and this team will hit, particularly when you get Beltron back and, and Reyes. A little bit low on a full count to Castillo. You know, this ownership group demands excellence in everything that they do. Why would it be any different with their ball club? And I think when you have a high payroll, like you mentioned, Gary, and you have talented players, uh, 70 wins is going to put everybody in a hot seat. That's just how it goes. And ball four, so Castillo works out a walk against a pitcher who it's tough to draw walks against. And the Mets have a one-out base runner with David Wright coming up for the second time. Well... Now, David was almost the first man of the National League to hit a home run this year, but he got beaten by five minutes by Albert Pujols. That's no shame. <laughs> right down the line. Well, Keith and I both say that uh, it would be interesting to watch this at bat. You'd have to think that the first pitch has got to be inside. He's got to change the program here. Two home runs off of him. Well, last one in the spring, tra spring training game to right field now, the opening, opening day home run. And Polino set up inside for the first one. Castillo takes off. Polino's a row, not in time. And Castillo has the first stolen base of the year for the Mets, who led the league in steals last year. Well, nice. This fastball thrown right by right, right down the pipe. Good throw, strong throw. But just too good a jump not going to get him. Well, that's one of those where Josh Johnson, he gave up a two-run home run in the first that bat to right. What are you thinking about? Not the runner. You think about the hitter up at the plate. Kind of lost track of Castillo. Smart baseball by Castillo who stole 20 bases last year. So he's in scoring position with one out. Fouls went away. You know, he's a fastball in running. He's definitely changed the program. David made a lot of changes. Works with Howard Johnson. Howard still had had David in the minor leagues. As you see, set up in. We're not going to pitch you away anymore. We're not crazy. Well, David talked a lot early in spring training this year about how last year he felt as though he was feeling for the ball. And all spring we saw him do something very different. He is driving the ball again. Well, swing the bat. You start feeling. You haven't got a chance. You strike out, you strike out. When you feel for the ball, it just you slow your swing down and you just touch the ball and just satisfied to make contact. And David was going to the opposite field. You let the bat rip, and the, you know once the ball hits the bat, are you swinging miss? It's out of your hands. But when you start kind of just slapping at the ball, which David did last year, I think he was just completely overwhelmed with the mo with the mo zone out there in right center field. And he just gets a piece of the slider. I think it's really the uh, in between being committed or being tentative. And you cannot be in between. You know, you have to be committed to what you're doing. And I think for David, learned a, a valuable lesson. And that lesson is if you're a major league all star player, which David Wright is, when you're in trouble and you're struggling, you're an inch away, not a mile away. And I think he chose the mile angle. And that's what really hurt him as he tried to make all those changes. Castillo at second and one out, one and two to David. And a look at second. And of course, the other piece of that is that, you know, what he did last year didn't keep him away from strikeouts. As a matter of fact, he boosted his strikeout total to the highest it's ever been. So what's the downside of letting it rip? In such an odd year, he hit 300. And a 390 on base percentage, which is certainly nothing to sneeze at, but power numbers way down. One, two from Johnson. They're, they're pounding them in. There's just no question of what you have to do. And I think we all expected, regardless of the pitcher, that we'd see a lot of that with David this year anyway, with pitchers testing him after he got hit in the head last year. Well, that, that's uh, honestly for any of these big hitters, whether it's Pujols, who said that home run today, David, all these talented 
right-handed hitters. You're going to have to pound them in. Can't let them extend those arms. And David stays in the at bat. Well, just for reference, there have been three Mets who have hit two home runs on opening day. Not me. Leon Jones did it. Only three? Bobby Bonilla did it. Wow. And Robin Ventura. Those are the three Mets who've hit two homers on opening day. Wow. Bonilla did it in his first game as a Met in St. Louis. That's over 40 years worth, right? Going on 50 now. This is year 49. Wow. 2-2. Two -two. Fouls back to fastball, but took a good rip out of it. Well, 13 times in his career, David Wright's had a multi-home run game. Wouldn't that be something? What a way to start. All the talk about his power. What a way to start the season. Yes, and to hit it down that corner. Oh, is Rusty in the house? I didn't know anybody had any of those wigs anymore. I thought those were retired. There's <laughs> big orange. <laughs> the eighth pitch of the at-bat upcoming. And David takes just off the plate. It's a real battle here. Johnson, I think, thought he got squeezed by Wally Bell on that last pitch. You see the difference in home run rate. That's a spectacular drop off last year. And the most severe drop off for any player since Howard Johnson, nearly 20 years ago. Isn't that right? 3 2. And the breaking oh. ball inside, and David works out a walk. So back to back walks issued by Josh Johnson. Well, that's the second time Johnson on the 3-2 count has chose to go with the slider. The first time he got a ground out by front court. This time, the walk to David Wright. So a chance for Mike Jacobs with two on and one out. Jacobs was struck out his first time up. Well, Josh Johnson would love nothing more than a double play right here. And Jacobs doesn't run well. He's a double play guy. Pull hitter, a good surprise on the outfield defense of Nathan is to the left of second base. The slight shade of the opposite field. I don't get that. Cantu way off the line at third base. Possible double steal for the Mets. Huge gap in right center field. And Jacobs takes it low. Johnson struggling as he did in his last spring training start against the Mets. A team that he has never lost to. 7-0 in nine career starts against the Mets and that pitch count getting high in a hurry. 57 already. Boy, you'd think that Maven would shade over the, uh, uh, the right center field with Ross coming off a calf injury. They're playing just about everybody the other way today. There's a strike. One and one. You see the numbers for Johnson against the Mets. That's officially having someone's number right now. That's Kruko last Yes. Kruko. And Jacobs pops one foul, one and two. Well, Josh Johnson throws the ball as hard as anybody in the game. Last year, only two pitchers in baseball averaged more miles per hour on their fastball among pitchers who qualify for the ERA title. Wow. Valdo Jimenez is pitching the opener for the Rockies today, and Verlander is doing the same for the Tigers. Oh, Out boy. Tips. And held, and Jacobs is down swinging. Second time that Johnson has struck out Jacobs is only two strikeouts of the day. Both, both on the same pitch, Keith. That, that fastball away is just beating Jacobs. The one thing he has here, see that little sinker action. The ball moves away from the left-handed hitter. He threw that with the seams there, didn't he, Ron? Yeah. So that was, was that more of a dart then? He more, wants of a, more of a two seam. He just wants the ball to start outside and run away. Well, here's Jason Bay with two out and two on. Bay single to left field his first time up. Polino comes back inside, and it's a call strike to Bay. And Polino moving around a lot back there. I never liked a catcher that moved around. Tony Pena was uh, the pirate catcher and went over the Cardinals, did that a lot, and hit his glove on the inside corner and then moved out, or he didn't know what he was going to do. It just drove me to distraction. He knew it. We were great friends and got along great. We never played on the same team. And every time I come to the plate, he always chewed tobacco. He would spit on my left foot as I was digging in. <laughs> 
And I just said, what the? The game was so unsanitary in those days. <laughs> That's fighting stuff, Tony. Stop it. That's if you were OCD. <laughs> That's you be able to deal with that. <laughs> Running with his Perel. That's right. It's too high. It's two and one. Well, let me ask you about pulling him moving around back there. Is that because he thinks that Bay's getting information from Castillo could, on location? Could be. Could be. You always got to beware of stealing signs and stealing location. And veteran base runners on the bases. Those are the guys that usually will try to do that. And when the catcher sets up inside, Gary, on a right-handed or right-handed lefty-lefty, it's going to be nothing but a fastball in. Letter high strike. Two and two to Bay. So I always used to like to get location on the lefty, Gary, when I was up. And only when they set up inside. Under those numbers with two outs and runners in scoring position, that's how you're driving 119 runs, which is what Bay did last year in Boston. 2-2 two -two from Johnson. And a full count. So Johnson continues to throw a ton of pitches. And now the runners will be in motion with three and two and two down. That's a question there, Gary, because Bay strikes out a lot also. You don't want to run yourself out of an inning. I, oh, here I am daydreaming. Folks, opening day and I have my first error. There's two outs. They will be running. <laughs> Third three and two count of the inning. And Bay fouls it away, and Johnson will have to do it again. Again, Johnson going to the slider 3-2. When you see a power pitcher go to his breaking pitch on 3-2, now three, three times against the right-handed hitters, that tells me that he doesn't like his fastball today. But look at that. That's a good cut, flat, level plane. Love a brick and ball that stays level. Starts out of the hand, stays on the same elevation. That was a great cut by Bay. 31 pitches in the inning. And Bay will make him throw another. Yep, and he came up and in. You know, we showed that graphic stat as we see the pitches this inning, 32. Just barely four strikes and balls. That stat we put of two out RBI hits is just a stat that is just so underrated. It lifts your team, it gets you an extra run, and even more importantly, deflates the other team and the pitcher who thinks that he's almost out of the inning and then no. This will be the eighth pitch of the at bat to Bay with the runner set to go. And Jones oh. misses the breaking ball, and Johnson gets himself through the inning. It cost him 33 pitches, but he keeps the Mets off the board and keeps it a 2 0 game after three.
This game will have Chris Carlin and Adam Shine fired up as they discuss the start of the 2010 baseball season and debate all the day's top New York sports stories on Loudmouths, presented by Geico weekdays at 6 p.m. only on SNY. Cameron Mabin leads off the fourth inning against Johan Santana and brings Wright and Jacobs rushing in with that bunt attempt. Mabin struck out his first time up. David Wright's two-run first inning home run has stood up. Been a lot of home runs early in games today on opening day in the National League. Ryan Howard is homered for the Phillies now. They lead the Nats 3-1. Pujols and Colby Rasmus are both homered for the Cardinals. Garrett Jones, who had 21 as a rookie last year, is already homered for the Pirates. Thought the pitchers were supposed to be ahead of the hitters on opening day. <laughs> Wasn't that way last night, was it? No, it was not. 16 runs scored. 1 2 to Maven. And he got him with a changeup again, second time in a row. So Santana's first two strikeouts of the day, both against Maven. Well, anybody with a great changeup, Ronnie, great sink, too. Look at that. You can see, you barely see the white in his hands as he really grips that ball and keeps it hidden, turns it over. The, the, the thing about Santana's changeup is that you can know it's coming and you still can't hit it. That's how good it is. So what's the solution? Just got to lay off it? Don't miss that fastball that he pops in there early. <laughs> Here's Handler Ramirez who fly to right his first time up. So see the grip? You can barely see any of the white in the glove as he holds it with all four fingers and that circle grip with his index finger and his thumb. On the side of the ball, right, Ron? The, side of the, the inside part of the ball. Out to right field, not a go foul. And perhaps in deference to the changeup, David Wright playing right along the line against Hanley Ramirez. You know, they're doing some of the things that the, we've seen the Philadelphia Phillies do with Jenny Moyer when he pitches. Santana's going to be pitching a lot in, and also he throws a lot of changes to Ramirez. That's going to get him out front. The ball is going to be pulled into that hole. Coral way over in that hole on the left side as well. Boy, I'll say. Up the middle. And there's your base hit because he was playing in that hole. Good call, Gary. And sometimes you can outthink yourself. And so the Marlins have their second hit of the afternoon. You can see Cora. That is that is serious. Yeah, that's like playing Dave Kingman. And look at that hole. And look at Castillo up the middle. But not normally that's six three in your scorecard. Well, I, I think that, guys, what we're seeing is that without Reyes here, what you have to do with Alex Cora, who doesn't have the speed and the range of Reyes, is that you have to go to the charts more and have those position core where you think the ball is going to be hit more than you would do with Reyes, who can play more straight up. Ramirez stole 27 bags last year. Corey Cantu fouled out to the catcher his first time up. Well, this is just telling your middle infielder if it's a changeup or a fastball. That's sign language. And the other thing they'll do, Keith, that you know, is that they'll go to open mouth or close mouth, uh, depending on the pitch, like you said, to see who's going to cover second yep. base. The way they've just uh, aligned now, it would take Cora too long to get over to second base. Castillo has to have it 95% of the time. Correct. Cantor takes high, two and one. Now, of course, the Mets have Ruben Tejada, the 20-year-old shortstop who played in Double A last year, on the roster until Reyes gets back. And at this point in his career, Tejada has a lot more range than Cora. And over the next few days, it'll be interesting to see what Jerry decides to do in terms of using Tejada, or whether he's just going to stick with Cora until Reyes gets back. Well, I think that Jerry's going to go with the uh, veteran Cora until Reyes gets back. And you use Tejada, who's so good defensively, has great range, and can play shortstop and second base in case you have to hit the Cora late in the game. I don't think Jose is going to be out much longer, to be honest with you. Well, he's eligible Saturday. That would be the fifth game of the year. And certainly the Mets hope it'll be no longer than that. And the changeup away, and for the first time today, Santana working behind on the count, three and one to Cantu. No, he's in the middle of the meat of this order, and he's got to pitch a little more carefully, Gary. This is a club that has some wallop. They got power. And one of those big power bats, Ugla on deck. 
after the tying run at the plate in a 2 0 game. Oh, it's Evan. There goes Ramirez. Strike call. Barajas' throw can't get there in time. And Ramirez has the stolen base after stealing 27 last year. Perfect pitch to steal. Good pitch to throw, but it was a changeup, Ron. And that was enough right there. Forget about it. Hard thing about a changeup for the catcher is that they know the runner's going, but they have to wait for the ball to get to them. And by the time it did, no chance to get in Ramirez. And a pitcher can't be too concerned about the stolen base when you got a hitter like this. Well, it's something that usually doesn't concern Santana at all. He gave up one stolen base all of last year in 25 starts. And even on that pitch, he looked the runner back as he was throwing home. Line past the glove. Oh. Foul. Right on the corner, right on the line. Well, we talked about it, how they're playing the line. And even though that's a foul ball, David almost caught it. That's double written all over it. 2-1 ball game. I don't know if we're going to stay with James Hoy as this stays foul. Watch James Hoy, the third base umpire. Give it to us, James. He gives us the real emphatic no, and it's foul. Nice. First, he got his chin out of the way. That was the <laughs> most important first step. I like umpires that are theatrical. Yeah. The Ron Luciano guy? Yes. Well, he was a little before. <laughs> Here's a 3 2, and can't do back. Good cut. Keith is more of a basketball Mendy yes. Rudolph guy. Oh, I see. Mendy Rudolph was one of folks who was a referee in the NBA for years and when I was a kid growing up and in high school, and he knew the moment when it was late in the game to call that three-point play. <laughs> yes, and it counts. <laughs> That's where Mark got it from, you know. He got it from Mandy Rudolph. He did. Yep. Again, the 3-2, and Candu fouls it back. Right after him. I wonder if he's going to pull a string on him here, Ron. Two, face, two straight fastballs up and in. So what Cantu did last year was runners in scoring position. That's how he drove in 100 runs. Also had 42 doubles last year. And people talk about home runs. Doubles can get a lot of RBIs, too, when you're hitting in the middle of a talented order. The Marlins were fifth in the National League in runs scored last year. They can hit. They're going back in. Ninth pitch of the at-bat. And the changeup fouled off. Well, wake up call. Oh, oh. Let me tell you, that, that rocks your jaw. Let me tell you. All that padding. And you got a sore jaw there. Well, they always talk about the bell ringing on opening day. <laughs> That's the bell you don't want to hear rough. <laughs> so another long turn at bat. Both pitchers have suffered through a bunch of these already today. Man, yeah, can't do. Lifts one foul. Marlins won 87 games last year to finish second to the Phillies in the National League. East. Looked like Santana kind of goosed that one, Ronnie, and kind of telegraphed that changeup. That's the first time he's done that. And we saw that a lot last year because of the tender elbow. I'm not suggesting that his elbow sore, but he did kind of telegraph that changeup. Well, Santana had an 11-pitch confrontation with Sanchez last inning. This will be the 11th pitch to Cantu. And he walked him. Tough at bat. So the Marlins now have the tying runs on base with Dan Ugla coming up. And uh, this is one of those spots early in a ball game that could... Be a turning point in this game for Santana. And that's why Dan Worth and the pitching coach are going to come out and really to give Johan a, a little respite here after that tough at bat. Talk about what they're going to do in facing Ugla, who Santana has his number. Ugla's just one for 18 against Santana. That one, though, was a home run, and that's about the way it goes for Ugla. He's an all or nothing hitter. This is the first time that Johan has been a little out of sorts here. Keith mentioned it. He's getting underneath his changeup a little bit. He's thrown a 3-2 slider there. His third pitch to Cantu to walk him. It's a very interesting pitch. He's trying something different. But Ugly again, a guy who hits the ball hard. If you get him to hit it on the ground, you get a chance for two.
So a big batter for Santana. Ugla grounded out to David Wright his first time up, but again, Wright playing toward the line against the right hand batter. And deep. Fastball hitter. Oh boy, will get the first pitch changeup, but up out of the strike zone. I do not like what I see of the delivery on that changeup. There's been four changeups he's thrown since the first, four total since the first time he telegraphed. He's telegraphed four in a row. Barajas moving away. And Ugla lifts one out to right center. A long run over for Gary Matthews. He gets there and he makes the grab. Both runners tagging and moving up. As Matthews had to go a long way to catch that ball over in the gap. Ramirez faking as though he's going to go home, but Castillo wisely just running it in. Well, he kind of missed, got a little bit of the wind there. He did remember now, Gary Matthews has never played here, and he's going to have to get used to the, to the wind. Now, watch both runners. You don't know if the ball's going to be caught. It's a fly ball. Now you know. It's going to be caught. Get back. Beautiful. That's both, both great runners. Outstanding. And Matthews has got to realize he's got no shot to get the runner at third and you throw a strike at second base. I think we saw a little bit there of something we saw early last year when outfielders were just adjusting to this new part. As Ronnie Polino steps in, you've got the gaps between the big scoreboard in center field, the stands in left, and the scoreboard in right, and you've got wind tunnels there yeah. that create very different pockets, and I think Matthews just got introduced to those, those pockets of wind. And this is not a windy day. Oh, and two to Polino. He's your favorite. When Santana gets in trouble, he goes right to that fast. Now he's 0-2 and doing anything he wants, Ron. Doesn't have to throw a strike. Popped it up. And Matthews comes charging in. Plenty of time to get there. And the inning is over. Matthews staggered, so is Santana, but not beaten. Two nothing Mets. It's opening day at City Field, and the Mets lead the Marlins. Two zip, David Wright with a home run in the first inning of Josh Johnson. That's where we stand right now. Johan Santana getting out of a jam. Gary Matthews Jr. will lead it off for the Mets here, and he had such an interesting baseball life early because, of course, his father, Gary Matthews Sr., the Sarge, was a professional player and a good one, too, for the Giants and then the Braves. And he remembers more, even though he grew up in San Francisco, his earliest baseball memories are going to Candlestick 
when his dad came to town with the Braves. And he said, boy, I really remember Dale Murphy, who always treated me great. He would let me open his new box of bats, and we would take one out. He'd let me pick the ones he would swing in the game. Then he pushed me around the shopping cart that they used to collect the laundry. And he said, that clubhouse culture, <laughs> I got introduced to it when I was like four years old. And I just, it was the culture that got me into baseball, not the other way around. You know, the preparation part. He said, I would watch my dad put on his uniform piece by piece. And I loved it. And I still put on my uniform like he put on his uniform. And there he hits like his dad as Gary Matthews Jr. leads it off with a single here. And, you know, funny story, guys. How about this? I asked him how much he emulated him. And he said, well, I remember when I was young watching him on television, I saw he had the wad of tobacco in his mouth and he kept spitting. So my mom was in the other room. I went and I was swinging his bat, his big bat, or at least trying to swing it. I went and got a wad of raisins and I stuffed it in my mouth. And then I started spitting raisin juice. The problem was... Get a white carpet. Mom wasn't too thrilled. <laughs> Guys, back to you. Well, that base hit for Gary Matthews Jr., a long time in coming. Gary made his Mets debut eight years ago. He made the team out of spring training in 2002. He played in two games. He got one at bat. He went 0 for 1. And now eight years later on opening day, he finally has his first Met hit. Jeff Francoeur grounded out to third his first time up. And that one gets behind Polito, and Matthews takes off, and he'll make second without a throw. Well, that's going to be a wild pitch, but it's not a very good job by Polino here. Look at that. Box it and send me a dozen. He's got to smother that ball, and his glove's the wrong way. The backhand will never work. And good heads up by Matthews. Didn't hesitate. So a runner in scoring position with nobody out. We have the number seven hitter at the plate. And it's 2-0 to Frank Cora with Ron Barajas on deck. Good eye. And Johnson behind 3-0. Good patience here. And this is what we've seen from Frank Cora, what he's worked on. That was a pitch that he would always flail at. A lot of pitches for Josh Johnson working with nobody out of the fourth inning. Look at the paper flying around there in front of home plate. No thanks. How can you concentrate? <laughs> you know, swirling in a little eddy right in front of home plate. <laughs> and that's a strike. Frank Cora thought he might have the, the rare base on balls. You know, in the past, I always uh, found Jeff Frank Cora to be kind of a premeditated kind of swinger. He would decide before the pitch was even thrown whether he was going to swing at it or not. Looks like he has changed that now with the Mets. And ball four, and Frank Cora's on with a walk. Well, Jeff said something very interesting about the way that Howard Johnson worked with him as Randy St. Clair, the new Marlins pitching coach, goes to the mound to talk to Johnson. He said, when I was with the Braves, all they cared about was that I wasn't walking enough. Whereas when I came to the Mets, Howard Johnson and Jerry Manuel never talked about walks. They just talked a little bit more about pitch recognition. And so rather than work from the result backwards, they were working from the process forward. And I think it's taken hold with, with Jeff a little bit. And I think that uh, communication with anyone is important but working from the Braves, working really from a negative point of view as opposed to Mets from a positive. So the lefty Dan Meyer up in the Florida bullpen, the reconfigured bullpens here at City Field. I was uh, there this morning. They're, they're beautiful. I know the pitchers could not be happier. Last year you had the Mets bullpen in front and the visitors behind. Now they're side by side. And it'll be easier for the fans to see the pitchers warming up as well. And for us, look, we can see Dan Meyer. There he is. <laughs> So two on and nobody out. Barajas will step in. So they have dropped the, uh, they'll bring down the wall. No more iron curtain out there in that bullpen. <laughs> <laughs> no gulag. No more east and west. There's a strike. Wow. Very nice. A sunshine day. Crystal clear. Barajas fly to center his first time. 19 home runs last year as a Toronto Blue Jay. Oh, and he lays off one and one. He's laboring, Ronnie. Huh? Yeah, his, his velocity is down. He's having a hard time hitting his spots. 
And watching Barajas, I think he's the kind of hitter. He lets the ball middle of the plate in. Not a guy who generally waits around a lot at the plate, just a 258 on base percentage last year. But he takes that one off the plate, and so he's being patient in this spot. Got the pitcher Santana on deck. How aggressive do you want your eight hitter to be here with the pitcher next? Oh, you want him aggressive. Yeah. You get a pitch to hit. You, he's not up there to, to mess around. You're up there to drive a run in. And Barajas pops one up behind short. Ramirez out. That ball may fall, and it does. And the bases are loaded. Maben never really saw it, and Ramirez gave up on it, and it just fell into no man's land. Well, when you assume that's what happens, Maben just got a terrific jump on this ball. This would have been a tough play. It would have been a tough play for Ramirez, and you got to go halfway here. You know, that was uh, three guys looking for the other guy to make the play as opposed to someone really taking a uh, concentrated effort to go get him. It is not an easy day in that outfield. We've already seen a couple of balls that Matthews has caught with the sun and the breeze kicking up now. There you see the wind, which is blowing pretty much straight out now. On top of the center field fence. So Santana back to the bases loaded and nobody out. And Johan lifts the first pitch behind short. This one should be playable. Coming on is Codwin to make the grab, and Matthews is going nowhere, forcing the throw. That's the first down. And that's nice. That's a little thing done right there uh, that Matthews did. Don't may force that left fielder to throw the ball in, even though you're not going to go. You might throw it away. Man. See, he could have just said, okay, I can't score on this. Let me just sit here and take a, take a break. But watch, he forces the throw. It might take a bad hop. Anything could happen. You're right, and he missed the cutoff man. So you're right, Keith. It could have taken a hop away from the catcher. It's part of the attention to detail that has been so prominent in Mets spring training this year. All those little things. So here's Alec Cora. Base is loaded one out. Cora is 0 for 1. Hit by a pitch and a comeback. Toward the middle. right before it was going to hit the dirt and he takes it to the bag Hanley Ramirez turning the unassisted double play to get Josh Johnson out of a big time jam it's still 2-0 New York Baseball is back, and Jonas Schwartz and Joe Beningo have plenty to talk about as they debate the Mets and Yanks with the Daily News beat writers behind all the top New York sports stories on Daily News Live, presented by City, weekdays at 5 on SNY. 
Johan Santana back to the mound with a 2 nothing lead as we start the fifth. Mets had a bases loaded, nobody out opportunity, but just two pitches later, Josh Johnson was able to get himself out of it by retiring Santana on a pop-up and then getting the line drive double play. We have our first beach ball of the season on the field. And uh, Jeff Francoeur tried unsuccessfully to kick it over the sidewall. Francoeur makes like Ronaldo <laughs> out there in right field. <laughs> Carroll, your premium. He needs to use a little more of the side of his foot. I think there was a little too much toe in that. An average. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Cody Ross leading off the fifth, and he pops one up behind first. Castillo with the angle goes back and makes the one handed grip. One pitch and one out. Well, nice play by Louie on this pop up to right field. Santana in need of an easy inning. One pitch, one out. Bottom of the order. Action continues in the Marlins bullpen. Burke Badenhop is up, and with Josh Johnson having thrown 81 pitches in four innings, at least Freddie Gonzalez will give himself the option of going to a pinch hitter. For the moment, Johnson is coming out on deck. Gabby Sanchez has one of the two hits for Florida this afternoon. Singled up the middle during an 11 pitch marathon. It was a terrific at bat that he had against a very, very tough Santana. Oh, and two to Sanchez. <laughs> now here's our ATT trivia question for today. What two men players hold the franchise record for the most starts on opening day? Is that uh, player or is that pitcher or yeah. player? I got a. I guess it means everyday players. Oh, two to Sanchez. And he punches one foul. Oh, well, Buddy, maybe he's got to be in there. No. Cleon Jones, yeah. Bud Harrelson, um, Cranepool. Angel misses and it's one and two. I don't think there's anybody more recent who would, was around long enough to, to be in that conversation. Seaver had 11, right? right? On his own right. Yeah. Not another ball out there. It's a different one. It's a little smaller version and just not going to try and kick it. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can't throw those things very far either, if you, even if you have that good at all. <laughs> it's a field mouse ball. First field mouse reference of the season. <laughs> I'm going to keep track this year. Very nice. One two from Santana. Sanchez again making Johan work. Well, they've got a lot of talent down in that minor league system. Logan Morris and uh, find the first baseman in AAA for the Florida Marlins. Sanchez won the job with, a, with an outstanding spring, but Morrison seems to be the guy that's going to get some playing time in the future. Logan Morrison is the Ike Davis of the Marlins. The guy looming. Nice at that. Got his hands inside that pole and almost kept it fair. That was quite a, quite a job by Sanchez on a pitch low and in. He's having an impressive opening day here. He's putting together two good at bat. A little cutter. Runs. Yeah, a little slider cutter by Santana down and in. Fooled Sanchez, but... You know, it's interesting, for a guy that was a clean, more of as a power kind of hitter, it seems with two strikes, he really cuts down his swing and tries to put the ball in play. Hit 289 last year in AAA. And just 21 big league at bats. Born and raised in Miami, went to the University of Miami, and now playing for his hometown team. Gabby Sanchez asking for time. He's one of those players that is a little insurance for Freddie Gonzalez on the Florida Marlins. He was a catcher in college, caught some in the minor league, so they have that emergency guy if they need him. Very underrated manager right there. One, two. Good eye. I'd say I'm impressed. Freddie Gonzalez, I'm going to tell you, this team has overachieved uh, under his tenure. I just think he's terrific. In the air to right, and Frank Corris steadies. All right, wind really carrying that ball. Almost like a beach ball. <laughs> it's too hot. 
such a strange outfield in terms of the wind that we mentioned earlier because of the way the stands and the scoreboards are configured. Little wind tunnels here and there. And uh, this is one of those places where if you're a visiting team coming in for the first time before a series, you've got to do a lot of work out there with all the angles and all the wind currents. Josh Johnson will bat and then takes a strike. It's almost because it's the highest part of the stadium. Bay is the most shielded of anyone in left field. And Santana gets ahead on Johnson 0-2. Johnson sacrificed his first time. in for a call strike three. Santana has his third strike out of the afternoon. Halfway through, David Wright delivered the keynote with a two-run homer in the first. He'll get another. Visit the official online shop of the Mets at Mets.com. Browse the largest selection of official gear, including the latest apparel, nostalgic memorabilia, and authentic classics for the whole family. Get your gear from the official source, the Mets.com shop. Accept no substitutes. Take a look at the Harris fifth inning recap. David Wright's two-run homer in the first off. Josh Johnson representing all the scoring. Johan Santana has allowed just two hits over five innings as he has held off the Marlins in his fifth opening day start. And the Mets come to bat in the bottom of the fifth looking to build on a 2-0 lead with Luis Castillo to lead off. Castillo has reached on a fielder's choice. Walked, stole the base, and scored a run. Well, they're shading in the opposite field and shallow as they should. You know that Louis has more power from the right side of the plate. It's amazing when you see how shallow they play him in the outfield and toward the line that he ever gets a hit to the outfield. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's hard to hit 300 when they're giving you so little of the field to shoot at. There's a lot of bodies in a small amount of space. You're right. I mean, because he's not going to hit it over the left fielder's head. Maybe once a year. Yeah. Which is why they can afford to play that show. Slapped out to short where Ramirez has a beautiful pitch up and in fastball tied up Louie right there. So one away, and David Wright comes up for his third turn of the plate. An opposite field two on homer in the first, a nine pitch walk in the third. They started the first at bat with a fastball away. Second at bat, fastball in after the two run home run. It'll be very interesting to see if he tries a little get me over slider to get ahead. 
in the count against yeah, right. That's deep. I would be more inclined as a hitter to look first pitch fastball in and just take a wall about it and try to pull it. But you called it running slider away. And in the outfield, they're playing David not only a couple of steps to right, but very shallow. Look at center field. A lot of space, but I'm still brutal on that telestrator. If hard caught by Cantu. And Wright has retired for the first time. Well, that's nice to see. And David likes to set up away and go the opposite field, and Harry gets a fastball and pulls it. So I just, Ronnie, you called it. You, before we started this game, you felt that you tapped me on the shoulder and said, I think David Wright's going to have a great year, and I think you're right. Still two out of nobody on that Mike Jacobs, who's been up twice and struck out both times. And he breaks his back, hits a little pop up near the mound. And coming in is Ugla to handle it, and the Mets are quick prey for Johnson in the fifth through five, two nothing. Living on opening day at City Field, and Johan Santana begins his third tour of the Marlins batting order. Top of the order, in at the corners. Chris Coghlan's been up twice, fouled out both times, and he takes a slider for ball one. Let's see right there, the Tents playing against the potential to drag bunt. David way off the line for the outfield play in the opposite field. Uh, David way off that line. And Coughlin hits one up the middle, a base hit. Just the third Marlins hit of the afternoon. And the first time all day they've had the leadoff man on against Santana. Right now it's time to go to Jonah Schwartz in the studio for a New York State Smokers quit line game break. That's Jonas. Cameron Maven steps in, tying run at the plate in a 2 0 game. Maven's been up twice and struck out both times. And Santana misses low. They had Maven in the offseason and in spring. His back elbow, he was more parallel to the ground. They had him make it more vertical to shorten up his stroke. And that is his this arm right here, obviously. Can you make that more vertical? Good well, look at that. He's, he's going back to his old way. He's got that horizontal. Interesting. You know, it's hard to break old habits. Yeah. It really is. And, you know, look, Murph this year, they got Murphy to Daniel Murphy to get less crouched and more straight up, and he struggled. It's hard to change a hitter. He's done something his whole life yeah. one way. 
I think you can give a hitter an approach, but it's tough to change their mechanics and their swing. So far, Santana's been able to dominate Maven with this changeup. And the fastball in for a strike, one and two. I wonder what he was thinking there. Gosh, if you're going to do that, you got a butt. Now you're one and two? Well, here's a young man they probably stressed all spring training to get a few base hits by the bunt during the season, but certainly not the time there to try to take a bunt as he got a fastball down the middle. So those feet spread way apart. Santana ahead, one and two. And what's that? I don't know. Now that's bizarre. That is. It's like, uh, I can't hit this guy, I quit. But with two strikes? I understand, but that's even more so. I quit. I'd have, to have, the, I'd have to have the third base coach come down and have a little discussion with my hitter. Unless that's the sign he got. Joe yeah. Espada, the new third base coach for the Marlins this year. Well, Didn't react as though that were a, a problem. Maybe he got a sign. 2-2. Two -two. Up there to swing. Hits it down the right field side foul. So I forgot. We lose we lose the pop-ups, Garrett, and the fly, high fly balls with the overhang here. We don't know where they're going. We know where they're going, but we don't know if they're going to stay in play. We weren't supposed to tell anybody that, by the way. There's our overhang. But that gives the fans a, a, a nice seat, and we will sacrifice that. Gary's brilliance will override that uh, hindrance to us for the fans to have a much better seat. Fans always come first. Absolutely. Santana checks in on Coglin, who had eight steals as a rookie last year, caught five times. So a leadoff hitter, not for his base steal. That's a nice angle right there. Moves away and this changeup gets him again. Third time in a row that Santana has struck out Maven with a changeup. Four of Santana's, three of Santana's four strikeouts. Maven starts out right on the outside corner, twists its way off the corner, and after three strikeouts here for Maven, that'll get you walking the streets of Broadway till all hours of the off day tomorrow. And in that at bat, Santana's changeup had more movement away yes. than he had earlier in the game. He'll turn it over more when he wants to make sure it's out of the strike zone. I think he's had that good sink on his changeup the whole game, Gary. He's, that's the, what I see. I love it when he has that sinking change. Here's Handler Ramirez, who has one of the three Marlin hits, single to center his last time up. And he takes a strike. Handley just three for 17 now in his career against Santana, who's about to throw his 90th pitch of the afternoon. And you know, Gary, we've watched him enough now over the years. But he's He is, yes, has a tough time with with uh, Santana, but he has quality at bats. It's a tough pitcher out there. Well, after Ramirez stealing the base, it's not that Santana really is trying to pick off Coughlin. He's just letting him know that I, I'm aware that you're over there. No more st stolen bases this afternoon. Maybe not this season. <laughs> but he's right. given up his quota for the year. <laughs> See that big hole on the right side for Ramirez. With Castillo shading up the middle. Coughlin runs, swing and a miss, and Morales can't handle it. And there's stolen base number two for the Marlins today. More than Santana gave a ball of last year. Well, just couldn't get the handle. You know, that tells me something, though. With Ramirez stealing and now Coughlin stealing, I would have to say that I think that the Marlins must have something on Santana, a little trigger that they know when he's going to the plate, because that's uh, highly unusual to see that happen twice. Not a great jump by Coughlin. Nope. If he comes up throwing and makes a good throw, he's got him. So now runner in scoring position with one out, but Santana has an 0-2 advantage against Ramirez with Cantu on deck. Struck him out. And the Ramirez down on strikes. Back to back. K 
K's for Santana, five for the afternoon. Well, climbing the ladder on these good hitters is a great way to go. Santana elevates that fastball, that four-seamer, and just throws it really right by Ramirez. So now two out. And Fernando Nieve is the first man up in the Mets' bullpen. Nieve has been a starter for most of his career. Battle for the fifth starter's job this spring, but now in the flip a coin Mets bullpen. Here's Jorge Cantu with a runner at second and two out. Ooh. Swings and misses at the fastball. Before the game today, Jerry Manuel was asked what was his biggest concern for this club, and he said unequivocally, the bullpen. I mean, he's got two known quantities in Francisco Rodriguez and Pedro Feliciano, and five guys that he just has no idea what he's going to get and hoping that somebody takes charge to be the bridge to K-Rod. And Nieve may be part of that answer. The one thing that Jerry doesn't want to do is he doesn't want to put too much pressure on Henry Mejia in the opening week of the season. Well, I think the problem you have is that you'd love to have relievers with roles. There's no roles out there right now, Gary, other than K-Rod and Feliciano. So what you do have is that you are going to, on the fly, learn who belongs where. Good change up, and it's one and two. Well, that's one thing Jerry has said from the day he took over as manager. He said, I don't give relievers roles, if you look at that last change up. He said, relievers make their own roles. What do you think, Keith? One, two, that nice change up away. You can't double up, but how about one more fastball in? I like the change up second for a bat pitch. Okay. That's a good fishing. Too good a fastball hit on that. One swing, it's Ty Bargain. Here we go in. Down the left field line, hooking toward the corner. That's an extra base hit for Kensu. And the Marlins are on the scoreboard. Coughlin scores the throw to second, and just oh. Cantu in the double. Jason Bay making a terrific throw from the left field corner. But it's an RBI double for Cantu, and it cuts the Met lead to 2-1. to one. Fastball in, Ronnie. I told you I was afraid of the good fastball hitter. Boy, he was turned on that. Not a bad pitch. Probably we could have had it a little bit up more. Coughlin's going to score easily. He can just coast it in. But nice throw by Bay. Close. Oh boy. Oh wow. Well, we say just got there. Very close. Question is, did he get him with that first swipe before he got him further up on the ship? So Cantu, who had 42 doubles and 100 RBIs last year, has his first of each. And here's Ugly with the tying run at second base. Here it is again. Let's see if he clipped his foot. Right there. Oh, it's tough to tell from our angle. But watch his right foot. It seems to go on the outside of the bag and never touch the bag. I don't think he touched him. I think he's... Oh, you're right. Nope, his back foot came in. Tough call either way. That's why a couple of bad change-ups in a row there from Santana, 2-0. And, and Ronnie brings up a good point. When that foot came off the bag on the slide, uh, on the slide and the back foot was a, a split second where, where he was off the bag. And all you kids out there, when you make a tag, keep the glove mm. on the runner because he may come off the bag. Jeff Nelson was not making the call as Diaz came from first base to make that call at second. That's tough uh, positioning for Diaz there. Never got uh, on the other side where he could really see that play. Blocked out by the runner. 2-0 to Dan Ugla. Oh boy. Castillo made a run to the bag with Santana through that pitch. So from that angle we had there from the high third, uh, he didn't make the tag on the foot. And here's your Coors Light freeze cam, my favorite. <laughs> It's whether he brushed it on the way back, foot on the other side of the bag. Did he get the shoelace there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, it's a hit batter if it hits, uh, hits your shirt. Sure. Why not? Shoelaces count. 
That's three change-ups in this at-bat that Santana has not thrown crisply. And he's come under it, right, Ronnie? I think what happened is that he put everything into that Cantu at-bat, and I think what happened, Cantu got him on that inside pitch, and there's kind of a letdown here for Santana. This will be Johan's 100th pitch of the afternoon, coming with two out of the sixth. I think he's very careful here with an open base for RJ. I agree. I think with the open base, even though you don't want to put the runner on, Paulino has power, but certainly not the dangerous hitter that Ugly is. Absolutely. Even though you're putting on the uh, go-ahead run. You got Paulino with two men on to end the fourth inning. Three and one now to Ugly with first base open. And he threw him another change up. This one a better one. Ugly thought it was ball four, but it was called a strike. And it's three and two. Look, you never want to show an umpire up, and you see Ugly, he's not showing him up. I always felt, though, as a pitcher, when the hitter did that on 3 1 through his bat, anywhere close, I'm going to get the call. Unless it was Pete Rose. <laughs> the man you could not throw a strike to. Well, that got the crowd fired up. Three and two to Dan Ugly. And he walked it. I don't think Santana had any uh, any intention of pitching to Ugly, Ronnie. Well, he threw him six pitches, five changeups. And you think about it, Ugly's one for 19 against him, but when you're a pitcher, you know which guys are the dangerous ones, and he knew, identified Ugly before the game. It's one of those guys who did not want to beat him. So now with Santana up over 100 pitches for the afternoon, you would figure that his assignment here is to get Paulino and then leave it to the bullpen the rest of the way. Well, no, the, I would like him to go seven. But the, the, the problem you have here is that even if you decide to take Santana out, and I'm sure he does not want to come out, you bring Baker into the game, the left-handed hitter, if you bring in Dieve, and Baker's a better contact hitter yes. than Paulino. Very good point, Ronnie. Yeah, I don't think that you're taking him out here. No, but no. You're asking him to get Paulino and uh, finish his six and... You know, that's his job for the day. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Now we got an off day tomorrow. The Mets are going to go five-man rotation. He's going to have an extra day off. So I would ask him, hey, give me seven. There was a day we wouldn't even talk about this, would we, Ronnie? <laughs> it wouldn't be a question. It, uh, it, they've, they've changed in midstream. So the tying run, Cantu is at second. The potential lead run, Ungla is at first with two out. Ronnie Polino twice is flying to center field. Castillo again makes a run to the bag, and again Santana throws home. That's the second time this inning that's happened. Yep. A lot of times pitchers just get focused on, they're getting a jam, and they get they just get in tunnel vision. No so offense. No offense. No, right. The problem you have here, though, is that opens up that entire right side of the ball. Lino. You ain't kidding. No, aren't kidding. He's not. <laughs> and Polino hits another one to center field. Plenty of room for Gary Matthews Jr. And he puts it away to win the end. Marlins get a run, but the Mets keep the lead.
New York Men's Baseball on SNY is brought to you by the New York State Smokers Quit Line. By StubHub, it's easier than ever to buy and sell Mets tickets on StubHub, the official fan-to-fan ticket marketplace of the New York Mets. And by GoRVing. Visit GoRVing.com to watch a free video. Go affordably. Go RVing. Beautiful shot of the Brooklyn and Manhattan bridges. What a glorious day in New York. Oh, boy. I could look at that bridge all day. Yes. Probably. This kind of day makes me want to wish I was living in Manhattan again. I look at those two bridges from my apartment, and I tell you, it's just uh, could mesmerize the times. There's a pretty good bridge right there. The newly renamed or newly named Shea Bridge. This didn't have a name Ooh. last year, did it? Jason Bay swings and misses. I tell you, we start at the bottom of the sixth. Jason Bay has faced two of the best sliders that Johnson has thrown all day. He's been inconsistent with his slider, but Jet Bay has faced his two best sliders. Hold the hanger. And he fouls it away, and Johnson gets ahead 0 2. Part of the sellout crowd here at City Field on a sun splashed afternoon. Should be beautiful weather for the remaining the remainder of this series, Wednesday and Thursday nights. He is one for two. He's singled and struck out. And there's a slider off the plate, one and two. Now Josh Johnson struggled through the third and fourth innings, but appears to have hit a, a bit of a groove. Just inside, two and two, and against a pitcher the Mets have never beaten. They are clinging to a two to one lead. And Bay is a rocket to left center field. That's up the gap and going toward the wall. Bay racing to second. He's going to take a turn and try for three. And he's lost it here with a third base hit. Jason Bay's not a burner, but he understands how deep these gaps are. He was thinking three all the way. Well, the play's right in front of him, Gary. When you're right now, that ball rolls to the wall. Bay has a look at it. He knows it's in the gap. Now he makes the turn. He sees it's going to go to the wall. Now it's all in front of him. Doesn't need a third base coach. Beautiful. Nicely done. He had three triples last year. That's the 24th triple of his major league career. And it comes leading off at the bottom of the sixth. The first 60 feet of Bay busted out of the box was the reason he was able to get that triple. And the Marlins are forced here in the sixth to come in. I agree. they got to cut, try to cut this run off. Nice at bat by Bay. The fastball didn't get in enough. Three. Matthews is one for two. And Junior takes ball one. If you're going to make a mistake in to Bay, it's got to be oh, now. It can't much, be up. Too much plate. And that Way Ohio TV pitch differential, you can see difference of about a foot and a half there. And the dirt knocked down by Polino, 2-0. Oh. Hey, if it was that easy, Ronnie, then everybody out there in the ballpark would be able to play the game. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I was just thinking, how many times did I miss going in? Too many. Well, with the absence of Carlos Beltran, so much weight on David Wright and Jason Bay in the middle of that order. Wright is homer today, and now Bay with a single and a triple. Two out of Matthews, and there's ball three with Frank Cora on deck. He doesn't want to walk Matthews. Matthews can run a bit and steal the base. The question is, if he does walk Matthews, if you're the Marlins, do you keep the infield in, or do you drop back to the double play? That's why they pay Freddie Gonzalez the big bucks. Already think, down by a run. I think I'd have to uh, play for two. In at the corners. There's a strike, three and one. Well, I'd have to say, if you're Gary Matthews right here, 3-1 count, you're not going to get anything inside. You can almost eliminate it and try to shoot that ball the other way. Johnson's best pitch is a sinking fastball away. When you're in trouble, where do you go? Your best pitch. Ooh. And that's ball four, and the Mets have runners at the corners with nobody out. That pitch could have been a strike. Dan Meyer, the lefty, is up. So is Clay Hensley, the right-hander. And that's going to be it. Here comes Freddie. So with Josh Johnson at 99 pitches for the afternoon, he will take an exit from his opening day start. Potentially is going to lose to the Mets for the first time in his career. 
Two to one New York as the Marlins go to the bullpen brought to you by Lincoln Mercury. Seems pretty. Josh Johnson out after five innings plus, leaves trailing two to one, and leaves runners at first and third with nobody out. As the former San Diego Padre Clay Hensley comes in. Yeah, that's where he had his best years. In fact, in spring training, he was in line to be the fifth starter until they acquired the left-hander Nate Robinson. Jeff Francoeur, first pitch swinging, fouls one back, coming back Polino for a look. But that's back in the crowd. Hensley off triple by Jason Bay, a walk to Gary Matthews and put the Mets in business. Hensley has sinker ball pitcher and you see the defense right there Gary they're going to play back for two it's the sixth inning you got three more cracks at the mid pitching you would concede a run here you're only two runs down you can come back Hensley spent all of last year in the minor leagues mostly in the Houston system but pitched spectacularly during spring training this year for Florida there goes Matthews and Frank Cora lifts one to center Deep enough to get the run home as Bate tags at third. Maven makes the catch. His throw goes to second. Bate comes in to score. Sacrifice fly for Jeff Frank Cora makes it three to one New York. Situational hitting sheets. Got to love it. Well, you got to put the ball in play here. It's a big run out there. It's a big insurance run. And Frank Cora went. Is that a change, huh? Change up, but he threw it a little too hard. He threw it inside, too. Uh-huh. Why would you throw front court change up? I don't understand that. So the Mets counter the run that the Marlins put up in the top of the inning and go back up by two. One out and one on for Rod Barajas. Nobody has come out of the on-deck circle as yet for the Mets who have action going in the bullpen. Santana's thrown 103 pitches so far. Well, if you got the clock on Clay Hensley right now, Razor shines at first base, the first base coach. He takes forever to deliver the ball to home plate. It does appear Santana is done. Angel Pagan is coming out on deck. Matthews stole four bases last year for the Angels. Razor Shines, who has moved from third base to first base coaching duties this year, and the new Met third base coach, Chip Hale, who has been a ball of fire all spring. <laughs> And oh, throws it away. Off the railing and into the dugout. And Matthews will have to stop at second.
first error of the ball game here. Well, Sanchez's got a glove on it. Well, it's not spring training. Things change a little bit. Put a little pressure on these guys and a ill throw there from Mr. Hensley. Isanori Takahashi, the left-hander, joins Fernando Nieve, the right-hander, in the Mets' bullpen. Well, they're all right-hand hitters coming up. It's going to be Nieve. Barajas hits one to center, chasing Maven back, and it's over his head! Around third comes Matthews, he'll score. Juan Barajas with an RBI double in his 4 one New York. Wants it away, right down Broadway. Bell tie. Fastball. Cross seam. Right down Broadway. Well, you mentioned it, Keith. He's a sinker ball pitcher. Hasn't thrown a sinker yet. Maven, who's played shallow the whole ball game, got beat on that one. Matthews does the proper thing. Holds. Scores easily. Well, you know Barajas has power, and he uses that power to drive in his first run of the year. The Mets now with a 4-1 to lead. Angel Pagan will now back for Santana, who leaves after six strong innings. And Pagan lines one in the right center for a base hit. Barajas hammers around third. He's heading home, and it's 5-1 to New York. Angel Pagan comes through with a pitch in RBI. going to be all for Clay Hensley. So Hensley, after the fine spring, comes in, faces three batters, gets up two hits. Mets have three runs home in the sixth and still going as the Marlins go to the bullpen again. It's 5-1 to one New York. Virginia. Well, Johan Santana sitting on top of the world now with a 5-1 to one lead as he's taken his exit. Josh Johnson winds up giving up four runs and five hits over five innings plus. We'll get to City Field as the series with the Marlins continues Wednesday night at 7-10. Tickets start at 11 bucks. Visit Mets.com or call 718-507-TIXX for your tickets now. Lefty Dan Meyer comes on to pitch for the Marlins. All those numbers, the three wins, two losses, two saves, ERA, and appearances, 71. All career highs for Dan Meyer last year. Grew up in South Jersey. First round draft pick by the Braves back in 02. Alex Cora will come on 
to face him. So Meyer brought in to face the left hand hitter after Angel Pagan came through with a pinch hit RBI single on the first pitch he's seen this season. So both halves of the Mets center field platoon, if you want to call it that, contributing in this inning, Matthews and Pagan. Cora 0 for 2, he's also been hit by a pitch. He came up with the bases loaded in the fourth inning with one out in a low line drive toward the middle and Hanley Ramirez made a diving catch on the liner and turned it into a double play to get Josh Johnson out of a big time jam. Keith 1 and 0 counts here. Do you push the envelope, push the accelerator a little, maybe hit and run? You could. The core goes the other way. I, I, you know me, I love to hit and run. 1 and 1 to Alex with the switch hitting Luis Castillo on deck. There goes Pagan. He's picked off, but it's thrown away. Pagan goes sliding, but he can get up and go to third. Ball just run down by Sanchez. So the second error on a pickoff throw this inning by two different pitchers. So for, 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 for Pagan to get picked off, it was not a hit and run. It was a straight steal. Oh, he's got to, first base has got to make that play. It'll be a stolen base for Pagan because he was running. And then the error moves him to third. First baseman's got to make this play. He probably should have caught the first one, too. I think what first happened was tougher. Sanchez, Sanchez was trying to throw that ball before he caught it. So now the infield has to come in again with a one and one count on Cora. So it's all falling apart here in the Marlins. They just. Well, defense was a big problem for them last year. Squeeze play certainly in order with Cora's bunting ability, especially against the lefty. And here it is! Well, and he bunts it foul. I like it. And the fans appreciated it too. They're cheering even though it wasn't successful. Beautiful. Beautiful time to do it. Right after an error by the pitcher. Pagan doesn't leave too early. Alex does not show it too early. Everything except getting a fair. Chappelle talking it over with Pagan. One and two now on Cora, who needs to put the ball in play here. And Alex slaps a foul. I think right here with Castillo up next, if Alex is able to put this ball in the outfield, you got Coughlin on left field, who was a former infielder. Maven's arm is good, but erratic. Cody Ross probably has the best arm in right field, but with the speed of Pagan, this is a great time if he gets in the outfield to take a shot. Send that run. Chappelle keeping an eye on Pagan. Slapped. Ramirez with the dive. He'll have to go to first. Oh, to the back Sanchez, but he got back for the out. But a run comes home to make it 6-1. to one. Nice job by Cora putting the ball in play. Good play by Ramirez preventing the hit. And the Mets have scored four runs in the sixth inning. Well, nice play by Ramirez on the dive. Look at Pagan. Pagan runs so well. Very nice. He was on contact. He was breaking home. And when you have a four-run lead, yes, you do that. It's been a rough inning for Gabby Sanchez over at first base, hasn't it? But he made a nice play there to get his toe back to the bag. Otherwise, Cora would have been safe. So now two out of nobody on for Castillo, batting right-handed for the first time today. Well, this is one of the question marks for this Marlin team, and it was last year, Gary. Their bullpen. Uh, it's very much up in the air. They're asking a lot of their bullpen this modern club. Broken back grinder for Ramirez. Takes his time and throws out Castillo. No, he's safe. He's bobbled by Sanchez, and the inning continues. Good Lord. The third error of the inning for the Florida Marlins. Boy, Sanchez just having a nightmare at first base in this inning. Well, let's take a look. 
That's embarrassing. That's a clap. Yep, popped out of the glove and tried to grab it with the bare hand. That's a clank. And that's like you can't dig a hole deep enough and don't put enough sod over you. But Assist for the shortstop error on the first baseman. Boy, you're going to have a left-hander face David Wright. David Wright lethal against left. Oh, boy. That just uh, flat out missed it. That's uh, um, Give me an eye chart. Dave Goosh. Doug Goosh. Doug or Dave? Yeah. The, Ooh, the that, is, that, is that how you pronounce G W O D S C? Right. The Padres catch it. Right. Three errors in the inning. Two on Aaron pickoff throws, and now one on Sanchez. Well, I wouldn't leave a left-hander in to face David. Well, Wright has consistently hit over 400 against left-handers. David having a good day with the bat today. A home run, a walk, and then a searing line drive that was caught. And we mentioned the defense for the Marlins. It's been an ongoing concern. So Santana out of the game, but now five runs to the good. It takes a little pressure off the Mets bullpen, too. Oh, right with a good, good hack. Gosh, I like the way he's swinging the bat. That's the old David. Oh, my goodness. Good cut. Big rip. Fernando Nieve getting ready to come on for the seventh. One, two from Meyer. Ooh. Up and in. Two and two. Now let's see. Already today, Albert Pujols has hit two home runs for the Cardinals. Garrett Jones has hit two home runs for the Pirates. The Phillies are killing Washington 11 to 1. That's in the eighth. Placido Polanco had a home run. That's what a lopsided game that is. 2-2 to right, and David lofts one into shallow left. On comes Coglin, and he gets there to make the grab. But the Mets take advantage of three Florida errors to score four runs in the sixth inning. And the new Mets... Just a beautiful sun splash day here at City Field. Opening day in the Mets offense going off in that past inning. All started by a Jason Bay triple. They're now up on the Marlins 6-1. to one. And if you're here at City Field, you had to have seen the new Mets Hall of Fame, which was unveiled officially today. And they really did a great job. Mets front office officials actually went to Cooperstown to meet with the people who put that together because there are certain things that have to happen, certain criteria for displays. They have to be climate controlled. They have to be light controlled. The security has to be a certain way. And when they are, they 
they can then borrow artifacts from the Baseball Hall of Fame and from other museums that are up to those same standards. You're seeing some of the footage here, the World Series trophy, the World Series rings. I thought one of the neatest things was Casey Stengel's notes. Uh, as manager in 1964, he had notes handwritten on each of the players and their strengths and weaknesses. And then uh, it was cool and scary at the same time, guys, if you didn't get a chance to go in. The original Mr. Met head. Um, and it, it was just the Met uniform with a, with a basically a paper mache head. Oh, gosh. Very Hannibal Lecterish. <laughs> um, but that, this was, they estimate, about 1966 when this head was worn and the Mets still had it, so it's out there. Uh, just a plethora of great things as Cody Ross rounds out against Fernando Nieve, the new pitcher here. You know, Tom Seaver has his uh, rookie of the year. He's got his Cy Young. Uh, Buddy Harrelson lends his World Series ring. Ralph Piner lends his Emmy. It's really worth it. I know, Gary, you had a chance to walk through it today, too, but one of the great new additions really uh, makes City Field feel like home. It's fantastic. The scouting report on Daryl Strawberry is there. Really? The forms of Mets through the years. And how about Ed Cranepool's high school ring from James Monroe High School? Wow. Getting in 1962. I donated my 80, I think my 88 gold. 87. 87 gold glove. Lorraine Hamilton. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> That's almost the original Mr. Met. The hands are wrong, though. That's a second grade teacher's dream, that paper mache hat. <laughs> Gabby Sanchez, after a rough inning in the field, takes a strike from Fernando Nieve, who did such a wonderful job for the Mets, filling in as a starter last summer before he blew out his quad in July and joined the parade of the disabled list. And that's ripped toward the left field corner. And Gabby Sanchez has himself an extra base hit. Boy, he's had an impressive day at the plate. So Sanchez is two for three, just the fifth hit for the Marlins. You know, it's interesting, Gary, you mentioned it before, that Jerry Manuel is going to let these pitchers show their roles. I think it's very telling, though, that the first person he goes to is Fernando Nieve. Shows what kind of confidence he has. And for you fans at home, made those seven starts, as Gary said, but... Of his 60 appearances in the big leagues, 42 of them have been out of the bullpen. So, no stranger to Fernando. Well, it's a good spot to break him in, too. It was five-run lead. Now, Mike Lamb will be the pitch hitter for the Marlins. Lamb was spent last year in the men's farm system in Buffalo. And imagine being at Buffalo, a veteran player like Mike Lamb, all year last year, played 119 games, and with all the injuries the Mets had, never got called up. Yeah, he had to feel like the invisible man down there, right? Hey, guys, you guys are struggling. You need me up there. He was a power guy, pull hitter. He was a 277 lifetime major league hitter. Mike Lamb, now 34 years old. Had some really good years in Houston, playing quite a bit at third base. Tim Wood is up now in the Florida bullpen. Nieve working in back of Santana, who went six innings, a lot of run on four hits. And Lamb cues one. That goes foul. Tonight at 10 p.m. and 1 a.m. get continued coverage of today's Mets Marlins game, plus interviews, highlights, and recaps of everything New York sports on Geico Sports Night tonight at 10 p.m. and 1 a.m. only on SNY. See Roy Halliday mentioned there. Phillies up 11 to 1 in the eighth inning in Washington. <laughs> Halliday era. Whenever I see era, I always think of ERA for us that are in this business. But yeah, I guess it is the era. Sanchez looks like he has to give something to the third base coach, David Wright. Yes. Being the emissary. Very uh, plastic cup. Gentlemanly there. Uh -uh. And make the third baseman go get it. It's the enemy. Two and one to Lamb. And the inside out to one foul. Two and two. Am I too harsh? Well, I think that you are trying to usher back in a different era in yes. baseball when things were a little less friendly. Yes. I mean, you could be friendly, but when the game was on, you know, it was the enemy. And don't do any favors. Two and two to Lamb. Lifted to left center. And Matthews easing over. 
That's the second out of the inning, and Sanchez back to second. You know what it turned for me officially, the, the whole fraternization The line thing? of demarcation? It was 1998, the McGuire-Sosa thing. Oh, yeah. When, yes. when McGuire hits the home run and, and gets the hugs from Sosa at a time when the Cubs are in a race to try and get to the postseason, and you're congratulating your opponent for hitting home runs? Yes. To me, that was that's where the, the whole fraternization thing jumped the shark. Well, remember, Mark Grace also shook his hand as he's running yes. past first base. So that that's, was why, that's why he missed the bat. That's why. <laughs> also, when the All-Star game became not, not so important to me, when Barry Bonds hit the home run that was robbed, he was robbed, and he wouldn't tackle Torrey Hunter. Yes, he bear hugged him. And that, to me, was when I saw that this is, you know, the All-Star game was prideful. Yeah. You were representing the National League. You did not want to have the American League beat you. I, I played in five, I think. We lost one, won the first four. I felt terrible when we lost the, 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 we lost the American League that year. And what have we got here? Wally Bell walking out toward Fernando Nieve. And I think they said that he went to his mouth. Yep. So they didn't call a ball. You can't go to your mouth while you're on the dirt on the mound. You have to walk off onto the grass. And so that makes it a 2-0 and count to Conklin. By the way, they just showed a shot of us here in the booth. And if you're wondering, that lovely lady sitting behind us is Carrie, our stage manager. And she'll be here all season, and she'll be right in that shot whenever they, you know, take a picture of us in the booth. So, Carrie, we have a little more room this year, so yes. Carrie gets got to be invited into yeah, our they, booth. they keep us a little more space to the back. They back the wall up. Carrie can be join us now, and it's always nice to see a pretty face. I'll never say no to that. Well, it's interesting. They're having a, a long conversation over this now with Wally Bell and Jerry Manuel. And Obviously, Nieve did not think he went to his mouth, and, and Jerry's letting Wally Bell know that. Nope, oh, there he is. Always oh, on the grass. Oh. Yeah, well, I don't if, think if he that was the only there. time that he went to his mouth, then that's a bad call. Yes, it is. So now Nieve has to regather himself. There it is. He went to the mouth on the grass. Well, he could, can't be then, though, because if he had seen that, he would have called it straight away. Right. It's got to be a, something a little later. No, I think, actually, I think the second base umpire called it as Coglin fouls it back two, two and one. I think the second base umpire, Jeff Nelson, got the attention of Wally Bell. So maybe his perspective was off because he had the mound between him and the pitcher as he was walking back up. See, that's where Nelson called. Oh, uh, Mr. Jeff. Well, he missed it. Just, just concentrate on this. Concentrate on second base. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Stay within yourself. Two and one to Coglin, and he fouls it away. <laughs> no, I'm not getting... <laughs> Not again invited to that uh, barbecue for the umpires after the season again. Isidori Takahashi, the lefty, staying busy, although it's nothing but right hand hitters coming up after Coughlin. Although Takahashi is not really a lefty specialist, it's something we talked about a lot this spring. He's actually more effective against right handers. 2 2. And that breaking ball misses badly. 3 and 2 to Cockle. It's interesting, right, to watch how the speed of the game changes when you take out Santana, who is purposeful, working quickly, throwing strikes, and it has changed, shifted here with Fernando coming in. The game has kind of slowed down. 3 2. And he uses an emergency hack to keep the event alive. Got a little something going in Arlington. Sean Markham for the Toronto Blue Jays is a no-hitter through six innings. Wow. He's become their number one with the trade of Roy Halladay. They got some good young arms, by the way, in Toronto. And that's a Texas lineup. Texas has always been an offensive powerhouse. Ian Kinsler, though, on the disabled list. That puts a little crimp in their batting order. Well, things are not projected to go well for Toronto this year in a stacked division where, you know, the, the Jays, the uh, Rays are better, where the Orioles are better, and not to mention, you know, the Yankees and the Red Sox. Yeah. But that would be a nice way to start the season. It's only been one opening day no-hitter, and that was by Bob Feller. 
3 2 to Conklin. Struck him out. Fernando Nieve gets through the seventh. Works around the double by Gabby Sanchez. Seventh inning stretch time, 6 to 1 minutes. Perfect spring afternoon in New York, and it's gone just about perfectly for the Mets as well. As they lead the Marlins six to one, heading to the bottom of the seventh. Here's your Mets' upcoming schedule. Remember, all Mets games on SNY are available in HD, presented by IOTV. And if you're in the car, listen to every Mets game on Sports Radio 66 WFAN. Day off tomorrow, and then night games with the Marlins Wednesday and Thursday. And then the Nats are in for three games over the weekend before the Mets make their first road trip of the year to Colorado and St. Louis. Let's answer your AT&T trivia question. We ask which two players hold the Mets franchise record for most starts on opening day. We had no idea. Tom Seaver and Bud Harrelson. We, we got them. Old roommates. We had more idea than we thought. Buddy... Started every opening day from 1967 through 77. Wow. Seaver started every opening day, 1968 through 77, but then he also came back and pitched opening day in 1983. You know, I remember that start that he had in 1983. I was down in the minor leagues, and we all stopped that day to watch him pitch that first inning. And the thing I always took from it is he walked in from the bullpen on the field, which he had never done before, to a resounding ovation, of course. Tim Wood comes out of the bullpen. He'll be the fourth pitcher of the afternoon for the Florida Marlins. Well, that's the first time he's made an opening day roster, Mr. Wood. Well, didn't he get sent down? He took the place of uh, well, Sanchez. Sanchez. Yeah, that's what happened is that he was going to open the season in New Orleans, but the injury to Sanchez allows so him to make Ryan, the team. Ryan Sanchez. Ryan Sanchez sorry, one of the three Sanchezes that the Marlins have. They've got Anibal Sanchez, who the Mets will not see in this series. And, of course, Gabby Sanchez, the first baseman. But Brian Sanchez suffered a groin injury in his last spring training appearance, sending him to the disabled list. Mike Jacobs, 0 for 3 in his return to the Mets. Two strikeouts and a pop-up. It'll be Jacobs, then Jason Bay and Gary Matthews. For the Mets in the bottom of the seventh. Josh Johnson went five innings plus, allowed four runs and five hits. If the Mets hold the lead, they will have beaten Josh Johnson for the first time ever. Mar, the Mets face Ricky Nolasco, who pitched as well as anybody in the major leagues this spring. Oh Broken back grounder, and Wood off the mound, takes it himself. One away. How many splinters do you think came out of that bat? Wow. Ball went, that went right over the head of Wood as he was going to first base. 
Isn't that the second bat that uh, Jacobs has shattered? Fastball running in. Running away. Yeah, Excuse that's me. that classic sinking kind of spin that you have on the fastball by Wood. He's got a great arm. Here's Jason Bay, who's had himself a fine Mets debut. Singled back in the first, and then hit a triple to left center in the sixth. That started a four-run Mets uprising. Bay, who wears number 44 in tribute to Eric Davis. Remember, he wore number 38 when he was with the Pirates, and when he went to Boston, they said, well, you, you can't have 38. We got this guy named Schilling. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so they asked him what he wanted among the available numbers, and he said, well, I grew up a big Eric Davis fan, so give me 44, and he has kept that now with the Mets. Am I getting old? <laughs> Every time I hear a 44, I hear, I think of McCovey, Aaron. Well, that's probably why Eric Davis wore 44, yes, because exactly. of those guys. But that, you know, that's how things get passed down through the generation. Yeah, absolutely. But the funny thing is, you know, Jason Bay grew up in, in British Columbia. Right. And, you know, the games they got on TV there were the Blue Jays because they were the Canadian team and the Mariners because they were close to Seattle. But he said, well, he never really took to those teams. He said he, he rooted for the Blue Jays a little bit because it was kind of a national thing. Ramirez with ice backhand play. Can he get him? He does. Oh, he really done by Anthony Ramirez to get Jason Bay for the second half. Boy, I don't know. Bay is deceptively quick. Nice play by Ramirez. Up hop on the backhand. And again, no stretch from Sanchez. Look at that. Come on, that's a close play. You got him. Get out there and get that ball. I think right now, Keith, after the day he's having, he's just happy to catch it. You know, he came in with a reputation as a decent first yes. baseman. We obviously haven't seen that today. He looks nervous on the defensive side. So two out and nobody on. Now Gary Matthews Jr., who is one for two in a walk and has scored a run. Anyway, Bay said he was, you know, he rooted for the Blue Jays because you're supposed to do that as a Canadian, right? But he said it was Eric Davis who really caught his eye. Wow. Well, he caught our eye when we were playing against him. <laughs> out to left field, chasing Coughlin back, going back, it's over his head and off the wall. Matthews racing to second, and he's in with an opposite field double. And that ball completely befuddled Chris Conklin. And dare I say, a ball carrying in City Field. Well, the wind's blowing out. Yeah, I'm saying it all day, and I think that's the first ball we've seen that has gotten a boost from the wind. Those are the flags up on top of the stadium that are over the left field line, behind the left field fence. So that ball really carried. I didn't think he hit it that well. It's three quarters up the... Outfield oh, wall went out. Some ballparks, that's a home run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice start for Matthews. Two for four with a walk and a run score. Here's Frank Core, and he takes ball one. Two for three, excuse me. Jeff is 0 for 1. He's also walked and driven on a run with a sacrifice fly. Oh, all the new Mets, Barajas, Bay, and Matthews have two hits in this game. Nice way to welcome yourself to the big town. Frank Core pops one up. Ramirez out, Maven in, and it drops for a base hit. Matthew scores, nobody's covering second, and Frank Cora walks in safely. And it's 7-1 New York. A nightmare defensive game for the Florida Marlins. Well, if we've seen one thing and one weakness in Ramirez's game, and it's not many, is he doesn't go back well in pop-ups, Ronnie. He doesn't bust out. You can turn your back to the ball, find out where it is, and then bust as fast as you can out there, then, pre then pick it up again. And whose responsibility is it there to cover second base? Absolutely the pitcher. She needs to be standing on that second base bag waiting for the throw. Not a good play by Wood. What about the first baseman? Well, first baseman can definitely can trail, call, but can trail, but he's got to he's got to hang around the bat in case he makes the wide turn. You can get him. It's it's, it's, got, it's the pitcher's job. So a gift run for the Mets, and now Barajas takes a strike. No, nope, he's just, that, he doesn't have to cover home, right, Ronnie? It's a pop-up. Yeah, he's just a uh, excitable boy running around in the field there. He needs to be at second base. <laughs> well, it's a double for Frank Hoare. <laughs> Somehow. Barajas already has a single and a double. Hey, the more Warren Zevon references you can get in a broadcast, we're all in favor. 
There was no roast beef, there was no chest. <laughs> so we're all, we're all set. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, you'll be drinking a pina, pina colada at Trader Vic. That's right. Oh. <laughs> with the umbrella. And your hair will be perfect with the little umbrella thing <laughs> in your drink. You know, uh, you, you know, we make light of it, but in this ballpark with this huge outfield, so important for the infielders, middle infielders, to get out there in the outfield. You're going to have a lot of plays on this field. But I thought also Mabin was tentative on that ball, and he has been all day, the yeah. center fielder. And the sun, you can see the shadows. The sun is not a factor here. The sun, you can see his shadow going this way. So the sun is over the left field line, so it shouldn't be a factor. Oh, and two to Barajas. That's now with seven runs and nine hits and a couple of gifts. And that one fooled Barajas. Wood has his first strikeout and the inning is over. But a couple of two out doubles produce a run to make it seven to one New York. Did they hear about the Titanic? Three no longer has the lead as the Rangers have tied up the Blue Jays 3-3. Fernando Nieve goes out for his second inning of relief. They see the score from Texas. Uh, Burley got that start for mm -hmm. Chicago. He's throwing a gem. 5-0 White Sox over the Indians. Three hits and in six innings for Burley. Paul Canerco a home run. Fernando Tatis comes on for defense at first base, replacing Mike Jacobs. As Nieve starts his second inning, taking on Cameron Mabin, who's thrilled to see Santana out of the game. Three at-bats, three strikeouts all on change-ups against Santana for Mr. Mabin. So trying to avoid the golden sombrero as he takes on Nieve in the eighth. And a slider for a strike, 0-2. That's a good slider by Fernando. You know, when he's not pitching out of the bullpen, you see Feliciano, the left-hander, and Sean Green, the right-hander. Nieve can really become a two-pitch pitcher. That good fastball and good slider. Gets it on the hands of Maven, and he fouls it off. Well, you know, one thing about Nieve that we saw when he was starting is he'd come in and throw strikes. Yeah. And on a staff last year that was often strike-starved, it was it was quite a revelation. Well, it's a uh, aggressive, always works when he's coming out of the bullpen. Throwing strikes, and Nieve does that. No. And that just missed. With a six-run lead, five-run, six-run lead when he came in, uh, you, you got to throw strikes. Yeah. Fernando's now 27 years old. And he got the first crack. Maven finally makes contact. But Cora throws him out. One away. 
You mentioned earlier you got K-Rod and Feliciano. Those are the givens in the bullpen. And then you've got five guys. There were about ten candidates for those five spots, but it was Takahashi, Green, Igarashi, Mejia, and Nieve who won them. And Jerry Manuel says he'll roll them all out there and see what happens. Well, I think what you have, Sean Green, two outings ago, struck out the side on 11 pitches. That probably got him on the team. The Japanese right-hander and left-hander, Igarashi and Takahashi, I think the unfamiliarity, unfamiliarity in the league is going to help them at least the first time through. And then how do you use Mejia? If, if, if Jerry says he doesn't want to put Mejia in high-leverage situations, would you bring him in today to pitch the ninth inning? Could be. Perfect kind of game to bring in Henry. On the other hand, you've got K-Rod, who has had such turmoil in his life the last few days. Grounded out to third, barehanded by Wright. But he can't get Jaime Ramirez, and it sails by Tatis. And Ramirez will take second. Castillo will not make a throw. Uh, David Wright making that bare hand play, and Tatis couldn't come up with it. It'll be an infield hit and then an error. The error will be charged to Wright on the throw. Nice play, barehanded by David. He's really, we've seen that over the years. You know, that's one of those plays. Uh, sorry, Keith, it's that nice bare hand. But I think if Fernando had felt the runner, Ramirez, he's going to be safe. Nice time to come off the bag and just block it, save your error for your third baseman. Ryan, did you play first base when you were a kid? I know, but I watched this guy. It was pretty good over there. It was there. excellent. He was a shortstop. You know, <laughs> you know you can't get the runner. Ryan, he's like one jump on the, ahead of me here today. You're right. Come off the bag. you got a big lead. Don't let the runner advance. So now Cantu with a runner at second and one out. Cantu in an RBI double. Driving in the only Marlin run of the day in the sixth. I was going to say with uh, K-Rod, he's had such turmoil in his life. The car accident down in Venezuela that injured two of his brothers. He just got back yesterday. you got an off day tomorrow. Do you want to get Francisco into the game, or are you better off just giving him a couple of days off to let him clear his head? I think there's a few reasons you want to get him to, into the game. One is that he's been away from the team, so obviously probably not throwing. He needs to get in the game. Secondly, we've already seen from Rodriguez, the more he pitches, the more effective he is. And you may mentioned it, the off day. All three of those factors, I think, are very important for uh, K-Rod to get in the game. Now, I think the only way he wouldn't, maybe, is that he's told Jerry that he could use a day to kind of just get his legs uh, back under him after all that flying. You missed the story yesterday. His brother, Eric, was driving. His brother, Leandro, was in one of the passenger seats. Five people in a in a, a vehicle driving in a, a desolate area of Venezuela and uh, his brother fell asleep the car rolled over and uh, the driver Eric was not terribly injured it was more Leandro who had uh, suffered multiple oh, fractures who's in really rough condition although uh, it, it not life-threatening down in Venezuela and it was it was awfully tough for, for Frankie to come back and and leave his family but you know he realized what his obligation was here all the Bob all of our best wishes yeah. to the Rodriguez family Cantu lifts one out to deep right center but plenty of room out there for Matthews battling the wind and he comes up with it tagging at second Ramirez goes over to third boy what a rough day for the outfielders and Gary Matthews has certainly experienced that but he's able to make the play a little baptism uh, under fire here he thought he had it and that wind is tricky it's always been tricky even the old Shea these winds around here swirl and he's look at him he knows these I, guys thought they had left the sun and wind behind them in Florida uh, he just said I can't take anything for granted out here mm -hmm. so two out Ramirez at third and Dan Ugler the batter Mets today trying to win for the 32nd time in their last 41 opening day games. One of the reasons they've been so good has been that they've got great starting pitching on opening day. If you include today with Santana, the last five years, Mets starting pitchers on opening day have given up a total of seven runs. Wow. That's two starts by Glavin and three by Santana. Always nice when you can go to your ace. For Jerry, it's what happens after that that's going to hold the key to the season. 1-1 one, one to Ugla. There's a strike. 1-2. and two.
Ramirez at third and two down. One two from Nieve. Oh, good and pitch. Wastes away the slider. Eighty-three miles an hour. Took a little something off. It's had a good one today. And Ugla takes it for a call third strike. Got the slider over the outside corner. Second strike out for Nieve. He throws two scoreless and the Mets lead 7-1. <laughs> Weekdays at 5.30 p.m., Brian Custer and Brandon Tierney will definitely have their opinions on today's game as they host the hot nine New York sports stories of the day in the wheelhouse, presented by Pepsi, weekdays at 5.30 only on SNY. Well, there's the answer to our question. Francisco Rodriguez is up in the Mets' bullpen and getting ready to pitch the night. Meanwhile, Frank Catalanato has been announced into the game as a pinch hitter. And so Freddy Gonzalez takes the ball from Tim Wood and will bring on his situational lefty, Reniel Pinto, to start this bottom of the eighth inning. And we'll see whether the Long Island native Catalanato gets to swing the bat or whether the Mets will switch up. Mets lead 7-1. to one. We'll be right back.
27-year-old Reniel Pinto will come on to pitch for the Marlins. One of that unsung bullpen for the Marlins last season. He, again, like Danny Meyer, set all of his career highs last season. Frank Catalanato making his Mets debut. 35 years of age, played last year in Milwaukee, but most of his career in the American League. Born, raised, and still lives in Smithtown on Long Island. And thrilled to be playing for his hometown team. Boy, so you spin around, and all of a sudden, veteran, and, and, and you come back and play where you grew up. Fantastic. Now, Catalanato wore number two all during spring training, but this morning, all of a sudden, he was wearing number 27, which uh, Nelson Figueroa had been wearing during the spring. That was one of the uh, the interesting cuts on the last day. It looked like Figueroa was going to make the team, but in the end, um, I guess that they decided two long men in the bullpen were enough with Takahashi and Nieve. Although Nieve has been used in the late innings today. And Nelson, who was a consummate professional and just a wonderful guy, will miss him. And his, uh, his plans were, if he didn't make the ball club, that he was going to try to hook up in Japan. Yep. And I think that'll be a good thing for him. It would make good salary. Still need to see whether he gets claimed on waivers by another team, which is possible that period has not yet expired. But Catalanato now wearing number 27, a terrific pinch hitter. Lifetime 277 as a pinch hitter, and that's uh, that's a good number. Yes. Other than probably Pojo and David Wright and Yohan Santana, probably got the biggest applause from the crowd today. Jason Bay got a pretty good one. Too. Oh, he did. You're right. Cap Lonato down swinging. Down tips it into Polino's mitt. And that's the first out of the inning. Wednesday, the Mets give John Main his first start of the 2010 season as they continue their series against the Marlins here at City Field. Mets-Marlins coverage begins with Subway pregame Wednesday at 6.30 only on SNY. That's when it's no longer opening day. It's just baseball. <laughs> Main against Ricky Nolasco Wednesday night and the lefties, Jonathan Neese and Nate Robertson on Thursday night. There's John looking for a bounce back year. After an injury plagued last two seasons, really. Must be a mistake. Nice. Well, number three. Got the number right. That lucky 13. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> Core is 0 for 3 on opening day, but he's been hit by a pitch and he's also driven on a run with a ground out. Look at that, Gary. You're big. They're all over the place. Must be a family. There you go. Not my family. Wow. His <laughs> Cohen's are everywhere. You know. <laughs> are those your passes? Hey, open up the phone book. <laughs> out to right field, and battling the sun is Ross, but he missed the catch for the second out. Boy, every fly ball's an adventure today. Well, he thought he had it. Oops, I better go right here, and quickly. Cody with that tender calf. Now Luis Castillo, who is 0 for 3, but he's also walked, stolen a base, and scored a run. Mets with nine hits, the Marlins with six. Mets took the lead in the first on David Wright's home run, and they have not been headed. Let's see if David gets another crack if Castillo can get on. But do you know that last year, right hit the home run to right field today? Last year, the Mets had two opposite field home runs at City Field the entire season. David Wright had one, and Angel Pagan had an inside the park home run to the opposite field. And that was it. 81 home games, one opposite field home run out of the ballpark, and Wright's already matched that today. A portent. Perhaps. This spring training was a poor tent for David. He just looked like a different hitter. And he's translated that already today into action. Two and two to Castillo. Well, I think we all agree going into this season that, especially when Beltran and Reyes get back, that offense is not going to be the problem for this team. And today, with Santana starting, and Nieve giving two strong innings of relief. Pitching hasn't been a problem either. Castillo shoots one out to Ugla, who had him played perfectly. 
And so Renio Pinto throws himself a 1 2 3 inning. And Frankie Rodriguez will come on and try and finish matters in the ninth. 7 1 New York. New York Mets baseball on SNY is brought to you by IOTV. Get the best in HD free with IOTV. By Mitsubishi. And by Frost Brewed Coors Light, the world's most refreshing beer. Now Francisco Rodriguez makes his season debut after returning to the ball club yesterday following his trip to Venezuela to be with his two ailing brothers following a serious automobile accident. 229 careers, 229 saves his last five seasons, 35 with the Mets last season when he made his fourth All-Star team. A non-safe situation for him here with a 7-1 to lead. Ronnie Polino is 3 8 in his hand. Three fly balls to center field on the afternoon. And Frankie just had a terrific spring. Really cruised through it and looked terrific. Trying to finish it off for Johan Santana, who went the first six, allowed a run on four hits, two walks and five strikeouts, two strong hits for Fernando Nieve, allowed no runs and two hits. One on one to Polino with Cody Ross and Gabby Sanchez to follow here in the ninth. Mets try to win on opening day for the fifth straight year and the 32nd time in the last 41 years. It's an amazing, unexplainable, four decade long domination of their opening day game. And that's been in good years and in bad years and it really hasn't mattered. They just own opening day. Two and one to Polino. Grounded out to Alex Cora. And that's the first down of the night. Right now, let's check in with Chris Carlin, who's out of the plaza, to preview what's coming up on the postgame show. All right, thanks, Chris. We'll be looking forward to Lincoln Mercury postgame live all season long right here on SNY after every Mets game, whether it's on SNY or not. Cody Ross, the batter. Ross is 0 for 3. Frankie Rodriguez had a late start to spring training this year because of a battle with pink eye, which lasted far longer than anybody expected. Forced him to abandon his contact lenses and go back to the goggles that he wore with the Angels. We 
wind has been blowing all afternoon, and keep, papers keep coming free. On Rahas just did a little housekeeping. It's, see the shadows extending from the third base line. Takes a strike. Good movement on that fastball. Good movement, and Wally Bell, the home plate umpire, has had a nice strike zone today. Very consistent. Boy, I just got something stuck in my throat here, like a little pollen or something. I was worried about you. I was going to 9 1 1. You weren't even snacking. No. Ross gets under one in foul ground. David Wright chasing it with the wind and can't get to it. Wow. Every ball that goes in the air is getting boosted 20 and 30 feet. And it didn't play like this last year, if you recall, early in the season. I think today is really an aberration. you got the wind coming out of the south, which it normally doesn't do this time of year. And anything that gets above the rim of the stadium is just getting pushed severely out toward left field. Ahead one and two. Two and two to Ross. It's like we're at Candlestick Park. Candlestick, Wrigley. This mm -hmm. kind of wins. Not quite. We'd be freezing. <laughs> That's right. Two and two to Cody Ross. Popped it up into shallow center. Matthews staying with it. Two-handed grab, two outs. Well, Gary Matthews, are you enjoying your first day at City Field? <laughs> well, I am uh, one out away from driving back to Sack Harbor in some serious rush hour traps. <laughs> you don't have the police escort out I'm, there? I'm not complaining. I haven't got any of my... My wife didn't come, and I've got no hovling uh, privileges. Well, you will have tomorrow to recuperate. <clears throat> Ronnie and I will be heading to the Mets' welcome home dinner in the city tonight. <laughs> You're invited to come, by the you way. You can enjoy that. <laughs> are you men seeing? We are. Good. Gabby Sanchez, two for three. The Marlins down to their final out, and he takes a strike. Up and down day for Sanchez. Good with the bat, not so good with the glove. Here I'm trying to put a bow on this one. And Sanchez stopped the swing in time to the satisfaction of Laz Diaz. One ball, one strike. Two years ago. Francisco Rodriguez set a major league record with 62 saves. Last year, in far fewer opportunities, he had 35. Wes Helms would be next if the Marlins can keep it alive. One one. And it's fouled away, and now the Marlins are down to their final strike. And that'll get the crowd to its feet here at City Field. Sanchez. as he retreats, and the ball game is over. Like clockwork, another opening day win 
Anderson for the New York Mets. Well, on the pitching side, you have to love what you got today. Your ace, six strong innings, only giving up a run. Beautiful work by Fernando Nieve, bridging that to get the ball to K-Rod in a 1-2-3 inning for Francisco Rodriguez. Well, in the offensive side, great contributions from the new players. Jason Bay, two for four, with a run and a triple. Gary Matthews, Jr., two for three with two.